Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam and Tea Podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. And today, we're coming at you with a very special episode. We're going to be talking about the newest album from indie music darling, Sufjan Stevens. And we're also going to be doing a little bit more than that. Uh, think of this as a sort of a bridge geography break. This is not the first time we have talked about Sufjan by any stretch. We actually did a discography breakdown on his work at the very start of the show. Back in 2020, uh, Sersha and Riley went into his discography in pretty solid detail. But Sufjan, he's got a lot of albums, a lot of projects, and there are many thoughts to be had and things to be said about them. So sometimes our opinions can change, evolve. We have a better grasp on ourselves these mm -hmm. days. So we're going to come at you with a little bit of a career summary before we get to Javelin, just because this is a uh, a particularly momentous release that we want to provide uh, the full context and scope for. Yeah. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this as well is that, you know, when Sersha and I did that video, which I still think holds up, go and check that video out if you want to see us talk about Sufjan in even more depth than what we will today. But I, one of the reasons I want to do that as well is that I know Jake has gotten more into Sufjan in recent years than they were in 2020 when we last sort of talked about Sufjan with that level of depth. So obviously this is also an opportunity for Jake to kind of contribute to this sort of narrative of Sufjan as well, because my thoughts on Sufjan are well established. And I think the biggest reason to talk about Sufjan's discography and the context of reviewing Javelin is that it is an album which feels like more than maybe anything else Sufjan's ever done, it consolidates so many different eras of his sound and so many different parts of what has come to be the Sufjan sound over the years through his many different eras, through his many different reinventions. Javelin feels like a real homecoming in multiple senses, but especially for people like me who've been fans of Sufjan over the years, who've gotten to see him evolve and push himself in all these different directions now to come to a place where all of those things, all of those disparate influences and those disparate like mass, like directions, you know, the vastness of a gulf between something like Seven Swans and something like the Ascension is completely bridged with Javelin, which feels so holistic and cohesive and exciting uh, in a new way that Sufjan records haven't been for a very long time, uh, even as someone who's remained consistently awed and wowed by them. So yeah, I think it makes sense to revisit Sufjan's core material and sort of trace the arc of his progression in the lead up to our discussion of this fantastic new album. So Sufjan Stevens, as you likely know, was one of the figureheads of indie folk and indie rock in the 2000s, released a string of records that married increasingly popular alternative and slightly twee sensibilities in uh, a younger generation of folk and rock music with these ambitious, sweeping concepts that married the intensely geopolitical and cultural with something much more intimate and tender and personal these grand, sweeping, epic records like Michigan and Illinois, which became famous and almost cliched in a certain sense. You know, after a while, Sufjan, with the density of the music he put out and with the particular, you know, idiosyncrasies of his style and with his omnipresence in indie culture kind of came to be a little bit of a running joke, as well as the the reputation of the, the 50 States project, you know, the statement that um, Sufjan sort of jokingly put out once Illinois came out that he was going to do an album about every single American state, something which he eventually, of course, <laughs> completely walked back. But it's representative of how huge he was at a particular point in time, how persistent and exciting he somehow continued to be in the public consciousness to the point where now he has an appeal and a fan base that are, you know, completely based within a new generation of people who've come to him for his late work, you know, records like Carrie and Lowell and have then retroactively discovered his older stuff as well. You know, Sufjan's continued relevance and importance and vitality in the music he's put out, 
you know, the longer he goes on and the more stuff he puts out and the more, you know, rapturously it continues to be received, the more of an anomaly he is and the more, you know, impressive his body of work becomes. I see a lot of people nowadays talking about how, you know, Sufjan's best, like Sufjan's 2010s era stuff, like Age of Arts and Carry of Lowell, is like inarguably his best stuff. And, and you know, Michigan and Illinois, and all that was just a warm up. You know, I've seen so many takes about Sufjan and it really is a testament to his continued relevance and innovation that these kinds of, you know, diversities of opinions endure. And, you know, what Sufjan means and the place Sufjan takes up in indie culture has shifted and evolved, but continued to place him really, really high up. Sufjan's career progression in a, in a in this weird sense is kind of a lot like the Nationals. You know, we talked about them fairly recently. You know, coming to prominence during this huge like moment for indie rock in the early to mid two thousands, and then you know increasing in sweep and scope and ambition and becoming the kind of voice of a generation. You know, later into that decade. And then evolving into kind of moodier and darker and more kind of languorous spaces with later records, while also converging with a new generation of indie music listeners in the late 2010s who embrace and fall in love with that newer sound where that starts to become the classic era to them. But let's take a step back and trace that. We can pretty much gloss over the first two Sufjan albums I mean they're worth mentioning I suppose as a matter of history if you want more detail Sersha and I went I think into it as much detail as those records really warrant in our previous video so go and check that out thankfully it would be very little time before Sufjan fully established himself in a startlingly declarative way I mean the, not just in terms of a golf and quality but just in terms of uh, realizing his identity so fully and completely, yeah, it's Michigan, his third album, which came out in the summer of 2003, is a staggering album in so many respects. It not only boldly lays out uh, an incredibly ambitious concept that, as I kind of alluded to earlier, would marry a you know deeply fraught socio-cultural history with very personal narratives of experiences that Sufjan went through and the relationship that Sufjan has both with his motherland and with his faith and with his history and all the ways that these things intertwine. Michigan is an absolutely triumphant album. Uh, Sufjan was born in Michigan. Sufjan spent a pretty sizable chunk of his childhood in Michigan and that personal autobiographical connection is you know it's one of the biggest things that informs the experience of the state's albums in particular and it's something that feels particularly potent and devastating in Michigan which I think is in prior to Carrie and Lowell at least to me this was the saddest Sufjan album there's just so much anguish in this record and what's interesting about it, and you know, one of the things that makes it multifaceted is that it is not just a kind of bleeding heart pion to a failed state. You know, you know, Michigan has not got maybe the best reputation of the fifty states necessarily. You know, it's got a a turbulent history, and it's you know known colloquially for stagnation in a lot in a lot of ways. But Sufjan's attitude towards the state on this record is not, you know, it doesn't reflect the stereotype and it's not wholly pessimistic. There's a lot of inspiration that Sufjan has clearly gained from his state. And there's a lot of possibility that he sees in it through this record. I mean, you really need to look no further than the triumphant Detroit which is just one of the most uplifting and inspiring and exciting pieces of music that Sufjan's ever written. But there is a sense of mourning throughout this record, both for the difficult, ugly tragedies of a painful childhood and for the lost opportunities of a state that had so much industrial promise and that has clung so deeply to a faded history of possibility and success sort of economically and socially and culturally so yeah 
it's an emotionally multifaceted album it has much of its devastation comes from the way that the state of faded glory and ruin that Michigan existed in whilst while Sufjan was a child and growing up and you know the painful and beautiful memories that he has of growing up in that place are intertwined it's also a radiant and colorful and vibrant album musically it very much establishes the Sufjan template which is a lot of color and orchestral vibrancy and flourishes and filled out orchestrations with you know trilling woodwinds and and massive horns and huge layerings of vocals these very defining aspects that would come to be the Sufjan Stevens sound for a very long time Jake what are your thoughts on Michigan as a step up but but also just as a record in its own right for Sufjan at this point in time this is in every respect just a honing in of all of Sufjan's strengths because on those previous two records, there are strengths that are displayed. I mean, it's pretty obvious that Sufjan is a very talented multi-instrumentalist. It just sort of felt like the potential that he had for, you know, fulfilling himself as an artist is almost fully met on here. Like from the second this album starts, it really does feel like a grand statement that an artist has been building to, but it just sort of happened you know like obviously there is a precedent for it but again the the degree to which the quality is capitalized on is truly stunning uh this is an album that feels like there's just so much life in it there's so much creativity uh just the identity of the the states albums that he has they are so rooted in history, in architecture, in an appreciation for everything, as well as, you know, looking at things with a more critical eye and seeing, you know, Michigan for what it is. But there's also a lot about, you know, nostalgia and childhood. And Sufjan weaves these threads together so beautifully so that you kind of feel like you're getting like a bit of a history lesson on Michigan, but also a history lesson on Sufjan himself and his relationship with the place that he was born in. There is nothing on here, nothing that I would call less than great. Uh, and, you know, it's a 66 minute long album. So that's pretty fucking impressive, frankly. I, I think that the album in its best moments is the middle, Holland, Detroit, and Romulus to me is like this like three track run here is just staggering. This is also an album that's sort of like retrospectively, I see a lot of people see this album sort of in the shadow of Illinois. And in some respects, I do understand why you would say that this is a bit of a dry run for that record. But I also think that does miss a lot of the very tangible merits that this album does have. I feel like tonally they're basically worlds apart. Uh, and that's kind of why I find this record in particular to be so novel. It's something that's, again, relatively scaled back when you compare it to something like that. The only overriding issue I have with it is that I don't think it's the best paced album in the world. I'm never not enjoying it, but there is kind of a, like a stretch near the end where like the overwhelming just sort of size and scale of it all does feel just a little bit fatiguing. And that's just not a problem I feel like I have with his other records that are also incredibly long. But again, that's really just sort of poking and prodding at an experience that I think is overwhelmingly quite masterful. This is the thing with Sufjan is he's so multi-talented and he's so masterful at so many very distinct aspects of, of constructing great music that it's really hard to point at him and say like, yeah, Sufjan's really good at this uh, because he's really good at so many things. Mm -hmm. The arrangements on this record are breathtaking. They're busy, but they're never cluttered. They are colorful and dynamic, but they're also really, really they're able to find moments of surging power when they want to as well. And Sufjan is also just really, really good at fundamental melody writing as well. Like Flint, the opening track on this record has always been one of my favorite Sufjan songs. It's just so quietly, brutally sad. And it gets so much of that from this very simple piano melody that's, that's laid down and the subtle compliment of these 
gently trilling yeah. and very sad horns and Sufjan's now iconic and very sort of characteristic sort of half whispered style this confessional approach you know he, he simultaneously has this confessional style and his performance while also being rather verbose and uh you know unwieldy in his prose mm-hmm. as well that's a there's a dynamic there between that that makes him really really compelling and also kind of extra as well in the same way that a lot of the big folk luminaries of the time i think also of the decemberists who had a very similar level of ambition and came up at a very similar time or making very similar kinds of records in their own way. Uh, it's just 2003, 2005, that sort of era was, was like, was primo, you know, pinnacle peak for this level of like over the top nerdy folk ambition and Michigan while I think it does live in the shadow of Illinois somewhat because Illinois is a record that, has so much more versatility and impact and surging power in it. I think in a lot of senses, while Illinois has always been my favorite over the years, I've come to appreciate Michigan more in light of Illinois as a slightly more reserved sister album. But yeah, there are also, I think, just so many of Sufjan's greatest songs on here. For the Widows in Paradise, um, for the Homeless and Ypsilanti is one of my absolute favorite Sufjan songs. It's really, again, like Flint, it's a very simple mix. It's this, the, again, so characteristic banjo sound, these really intimate but well-voiced vocal performances, these beautiful backing vocals. And again, this simple surge that never explodes, but lifts the song up so much uh, emotionally. Uh, you mentioned the fantastic stretch in the middle of the record of Holland, Detroit, and Romulus. Absolutely three of the most distinctive and memorable songs on the album. Romulus is, it's such, that's a big song for me. It's a big song for Sufjan. A lot of the memories and feelings that are expressed in the song will be revisited in great detail on Carrie and Lowell. It is a song about a very specific experience of watching your mother wither away. Um, and then you have songs like the the epic nine minute acoustic ballad of Oh God, Where Are You Now? Which is one of Sufjan's most overtly uh, faithful songs that that lays out the importance of his relationship with Christ in, in intensely emotional and evocative detail and something he will go on to embellish in the very next album, which I would say this is the Sufjan album that I suppose my opinion on it has shifted the most compared to when I did that video with Sersha three years ago. My opinion hasn't shifted that much, but just like the uh, my opinions on the other records were so ironclad. This is a, a record where every time I come back to it, I'm like, man, I've been underrating this. It's it's so modest and what it sets out to do. And of course, it is pinned between these two towering epic grand sweeping works that by design it's almost placed to be overlooked or to feel as though it is a kind of sidestep or almost a side project for Sufjan but when you engage with that it is so immensely intimate and personal that it's kind of breathtaking it's hard to express what's so masterful about Seven Swans without feeling as though you're overstating the impact of very simple things but it really has to be impressed how beautifully elegant and and you know subtly sophisticated Sufjan's acoustic guitar compositions and little like flourishes and melodies actually are you know I think of a song like The Dress Looks Nice On You which is just so gorgeously ornate and it's very simple plucked acoustic line there's just so much little details and flourishes in that that you know if I was any good at playing an acoustic instrument I would want to play a song like this because it presents itself as so simple on the face of it but has so much beautiful layering within a very simple performance again Sufjan while we think of him as such a maximalist artist he's so great at pulling a large impact from a very simple arrangement. A song like In the Devil's Territory is basically just like a very repetitive two or three note banjo plucked part that just 
builds and builds and builds and builds across the five minutes of the song till you feel like this ascendant triumph. Um, the record is great at doing that. And the last couple of songs on the record as well do a good job of, of giving you that sense of sweep too. But I really think the album succeeds and has a lot of its most, a lot of its power in its intimacy. Songs like To Be Alone With You, which is one of the most fan beloved uh, Sufjan songs mm-hmm. from this album. Uh, Abraham, the eternally underrated Size Too Small, which is such a gorgeously tender yes. song about uh is it a love is it just an affection it's about a connection between Sufyan and another person that's come to mean something very profound to him uh the early rumblings of the extremely overplayed but nevertheless always relevant cliche of is this Sufyan Stevens song about being gay or about Jesus uh here's ground zero the answer is always um, So yes, yes, while Seven Swans is in a strange position, uh, bound to be overlooked by its comparative modesty, is a great showcase for how Sufyan is actually incredibly talented at the fundamental aspects of songwriting and musicianship and doesn't need to rely on the ostentatious arrangements of his bigger projects to land an emotional impact. He can get that even with the barest of elements. And I think that is the the, mo- the biggest triumph of Seven Swans. Couldn't really have said it better myself. This is a project that I found particularly refreshing when going back through Sufjan's catalog, just because, again, it is that more comparatively modest, comparatively simple affair that also does display lots of fantastic songwriting and fantastic guitar playing. Riley, I'm wondering if maybe your appreciation for this growing is because of your continued affinity for Big Thief and the solo work of Adrian Lanker. (laughs) Because frankly, uh, when I was listening to Seven Swans, all I could think about was how much it reminded me of things like Abyss Kiss. And uh, it also made me latch on to it more strongly than I anticipated to. Um, In terms of underrated songs on here, I completely agree with you uh, on like, there's a really mostly every song on here is fantastic. Uh, My personal favorite being a good man is hard to find. Uh, I find that to be one of the most intimate songs that he's written up until this point. Uh, The only real like, stumble on the album is the kind of brief and inessential he woke me up again but even then this is an album that i appreciate both within the context of sufyan's discography and just like on an island i think it's just a fantastic folk record if you find yourself sometimes like sufyan's aesthetic can be a bit a bit much frankly and if you need a more accessible in to his work I could not recommend Yeah, I think there's enough. like a, and it's an understandable, right? Sufjan in this era has a kind of tweeness to him. I think it's most true of Illinois. You know, this kind of cuteness, this sort of preciousness that can turn some people off. Uh, it's a fairly shallow perception because I think, mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of, of depth and density in his songwriting that kind of means that those sorts of things that might be perceived as affectations don't really matter all that much because they're not like, you know, covering up for anything. It's just an aspect of the way he performs. But what's interesting about a record like this is that it's so stripped back. It it takes so much of the, you know, complexity in terms of arrangement out of the question. And yet it might be the least sort of twee and cutesy Sufjan album of this era in some ways, because it, it never feels like he's, putting on an affectation or it never feels like he's you know false in his emotions or or overly sort of coy or precious in any way it's a really emotionally circumspect and and collected and sweet album that i feel like is very easy to connect with which is all the more impressive because it is so you know fundamentally it's a christian folk album these songs are about jesus some of them are about biblical stories many of them in sufyan's way blend biblical storytelling with autobiography to the extent where to which unless you're a theologist or just someone who's been made to study the bible a whole bunch you may not be able to tell you know the distinction between these things and that's one of the greatest successes of the record as well is that it it melds 
Sufyan's faith and the influence that his faith has had on his view of the world and his sense of what love is. And it blends that with, you know, real stories of, of coming of age and of intimate moments and of, of finding connections with people as well as with God. So yeah, it's a, it's a lovely little record. And I think part of my connection with it more recently as well is that every time I come back to it, it's one of those albums where like, I know it better than I think I do. And it's a product of the fact that when I was getting into Sufjan as a teenager, Michigan Seven Swans, Illinois and Age of Arts were the only real records I had. And so I would, I listened to them a lot, but I especially listened to Illinois and Age of Arts a lot, such so much so that I kind of over time forgot how well I knew Michigan and Seven Swans. So coming back to them, it's like this hit of familiarity, like, oh shit, I know these songs inside out, even though I don't listen to them all that much. So that's endeared me to it as well. I also just want to, this is a random thing, but um, the Transfiguration, the closing track on the record, it's, again, another great Sufjan closer. He's great Beautiful. at giving you these endings that feel like they're tying a bow on everything, but also kind of lifting you up. Um, there's a little vocal thing he does in the sort of climax of the song where he has this little triplet um, thing in his sort of vocal cadence. You know, son of God, we draw near, turn your ear. And it's the same little triplet uh, melodic cadence that he does in Chicago on Illinois and with the all things go all things go this song all so, things like, go easy, yeah easy yeah it you is. can almost yeah. hear how you know Sufjan's in- influencing himself in certain ways I mean these records were created in such close proximity that you know as distinct and as separate as uh, Seven Swans may feel initially there is a real continuity and a real sense of an evolving artistic progression, even in this apparent sidestep album. So, you know, I think that, um, you know, people overlook or underestimate Seven Swans at their own peril. And also the understatement of that record set up Illinois to be the triumph it was in some pretty powerful ways. I mean, this record was like Arcade Fire's funeral or Animal Collective's feels it was like an instant indie canonized classic the second that it landed it was just this sense of of momentousness surrounding it one of the things that's most impressive about it and this is true of many of the most enduring of those indie classics of this time is how remarkably of its time but not dated it sounds like this is a record that could only have been made and certainly could only have had the level of success that it had in a very particular time in history. Uh, what is, I see often referred to as garden state era <laughs> indie culture, which is definitely a pejorative, <laughs> oh, but you know, this is the thing, right? Is that Illinois is a part of that, but it transcends it so much. This is a grand sweeping, you know, ambitious concept album that does all of the same sorts of things for, the notion of of state identity and history and the melding of of the history of the historical on a on a on a national level as a part of your identity with your personal individual intimate experiences growing up all the same shit that Michigan did Illinois does it just and I'm calling it Illinois purposefully because its full title is Sufjan Stevens invites you to come on feel the Illinois uh, <laughs> it's is all of the things that Michigan is, but also so much more. It is radiant. It is triumphant. It is uh, much more emotionally all over the place uh, without feeling scattered. Many of the orchestral arrangements that felt so exciting and ambitious and engaging for Sufjan on Michigan are made utterly transcendent on this album i mean one of sufyan's greatest achievements musically i think still to this day is come on feel the illinois which is a song that never fails to completely take my breath away it's just a massive sweeping multi-part you know progressive have to say it wondrous piece of music with so much like sly humor and meta commentary on songwriting and the creative process 
and his, you know state history and all this layers and layers of shit that you could write a whole english essay on melded into this six minute piece that takes sufyan's obsession with philip glass my god do, do his arrangements show mm-hmm. so much obsession with philip glass on this album but just completely pushing that into this sort of totally ostentatious arena of of storytelling and and char- charisma mastery i mean my god where do you begin with an album like illinois jake i was somewhat late to the party with this one just because the first sufyan album i heard was carrie and lowell and it took me a while to just dig into his back catalog but i'm pretty sure this is the album that i did it with and as somebody who was unfamiliar with his work beforehand i had no real idea what I was getting into just because again the the more reserved folk sound of Carrie and Lowell was my only context for him so imagine if you will me going back and just experiencing the overwhelming size and splendor of an album like this it is absolutely towering as an achievement that is as impressive as it is so much fun to listen to like there are moments of these exuberant celebrations of what feels like just music in general they're uh stuff like uh they are night zombies they are neighbors they have come back from the dead ah are some of the most enjoyably upbeat and awesome things that he's ever made that are imbued with a sense of humor and scale and wit that are just infinitely fun to come back to and witness but this also has a really you know it has that distinct personal edge that michigan had with you know the most classic and in during things that he's made, like John Wayne Gacy Jr., for example, uh, or Casimir Pulaski Day, where he really, really digs into these parts of himself that are just so myopic and so interior that you'd feel like you're getting the spectrum of the human experience when you listen to it. Uh, For a while, I would have even considered Illinois to be my favorite of Sufjan's work. And while I wouldn't quite say that now, I'm still no less taken no less impressed with it it's again it's a big record it runs the risk of being overwhelming but the more i listen to it the less i find that that's a problem i have almost nothing negative to say about this uh i do want to say that one of my favorite sufjan stevens songs in general is one song that is certainly beloved but i never hear talked about as a highlight of this album and that is the opener concerning the ufo sighting near highland illinois it's just That piano melody is just so fucking beautiful. I think about it like all the time, irrespective of like when I'm listening to music, I'll just think about it sometimes and be like, God. And then you just have that, that lilting, gentle, the, it's 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 gorgeous i i love it i love how high concept it is i love how sprawling it is. I love how multifaceted it is. It's just, it's a classic in every sense of the word. I completely agree. I mean, one of the things that I always say about, you know, the sprawl of the record and all of the little like short tracks in between the larger pieces is that, you know, in a way it's like, yes, these little outros or intros could just be a part of the song they're attached to, but they're separate. And I feel like part of the reason is that it gives Sufjan an excuse to give you more you know, like how these songs will just have mm-hmm. such descriptive and over the top titles. Even these interludes will like paint a very vivid picture or a very kind of strange idea that just fills out the wider tapestry of what the record is. The Black Hawk War or how to demolish an entire civilization and still feel good about yourself in the morning or we apologize for the inconvenience but you're going to have to leave now or I have fought the big knives and will continue to fight them until they are off our lands. Yeah, just so loaded. Like the song barely even gets into any of what that alludes to yet it exists and you have that title just as another part of this massive sprawling monolith that the record is my favorite uh like interlude title personally is a conjunction of drones simulating the way in which sufian stevens has an existential crisis in the great godfrey maze like there is just like so much like there's a personal like experience that's just given to you in the title of that song like a whole like you know thing that you imagine in your head a whole world that you create 
that adds so much and that I think involves you more and more in the personal story that Sufyan is, is telling or the, the picture of Sufyan's young life and growing up and his relationship to his state as he's aged that the whole record gives you on a wider scale. I mean, there's nothing more that can be said about songs like John Wayne Gacy Jr. and Chicago and Casimir Pulaski Day that has already been said, not just by me in the previous Sufjan video that I did with Sersha, but just by people in general. They are classic songs. Uh, it's interesting to me, when I was a kid getting into Sufjan, it felt like you know Chicago and Casimir Pulaski Day were the biggest uh, Sufjan songs in general, certainly the biggest one in this album, but it feels like more and more as the record ages, the consensus on not only the best song on this record, but Sufjan's best song in general, seems to solidify around the predatory wasp of the Palisades is out to get us, which is yep. for a good reason. Not that I'm saying anything that hasn't been said before here, but this is probably the greatest gay love song ever written. Uh, it is utterly heartbreaking yeah but also yeah. uplifting emotionally transcendental and ridiculously simple but beautiful piece of music i mean it is just utterly devastating it, it paints a vivid picture of a very specific shared moment of intimacy and fear between two young people the overwhelming presence of internalized homophobia as captured in the metaphor of the predatory wasp and this the way that it all crystallizes around the single moment of, of shared connection and and fear and sprawls outward from that to capture the beauty of the entire relationship and how much it still influences and stays with Sufyan how much love he still has the final section of that song where the 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 wood woodwinds and vocals are just surging and Sufyan is simultaneously like while maintaining this very intimate confessional tone that he's mastered is also you know like just giving one of the most emotionally evocative vocal performances I've ever heard in my life it is an astonishing astonishing song that always always brings me to tears um and yeah the record is it's both more than the sum of its parts and also those individual parts are astonishing and and, and remarkable and some of the greatest songs of the 2000s certainly still some of the greatest songs that Sufjan's ever written the fact that his legacy is not completely consumed by this album is a complete fucking anomaly considering the magnitude of this as yeah. a testament to how compelling and, and powerful of a songwriter and a, of a musician he's continued to be. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, the record hasn't come to define Sufjan, but also hasn't come to be swallowed up by the stuff he's done subsequent to it is also a testament to how powerful it is i mean there is just no shortage of fawning i can give this album so with this incredibly prolific period for sufyan reaching a natural climax with this album uh we begin the 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 five-year wait for major projects that came to kind of define uh Sufyan's career arc and, it used to, and become a meme in its own right you know the two thousand the five-year wait from Illinois to Age of Ards the five-year wait from Age of Ards to Carrion Lowell the five-year wait from Carrion Lowell to the Ascension of course reductively overlooking the many side projects that color Sufyan's discography in between these major releases that would begin with 2006's Songs for Christmas you know, a, a sprawling, <laughs> indulgent, and absolutely hysterically giddily fun collection of both Christmas standards and Christmas originals that runs for a eye-watering two hours, to then be followed in 2012 by the even better, more ostentatious, and more ridiculous Silver and Gold, which is a you know, almost three hours of, of Christmas excess, uh, culminating in one of my absolute favorite Sufjan songs of all time, the ridiculous and awesome Christmas Unicorn. 
um, just have to throw a shout out for these records. I can't. Uh, in- yeah, it's just Wallace song. The the world's greatest stealthily hidden Joy Division cover ever. I can't in good conscience encourage anyone to listen to either of these Christmas albums front to back unless you really, really <laughs> fucking love Christmas. Or Sufian. I'm waiting for the holiday season to happen so I can put these on in my car. So I, I'll um, be looking forward to like, that. I think it was in 2015, Christmas season of 2015, when I was um, with a girl who was like really into Christmas. I um, put on Silver and Gold. And like even she was like just in the background while we were like doing shit. And even she was like, we have to tap out of this by like halfway through. This is just too much. <laughs> I think part of it with silver and gold as well as that, there's some absolutely ridiculous, like this is post age of odds. So that record gets really weird and electronic and you have songs like, uh, do you hear what I hear? And the child with the star on his head, you know, stretch 10, 15 minutes really go out there. But you also just have some beautifully faithful Christmas standards that have never sounded better. Songs for Christmas is really the one that has more of the the Christmas standards on it. And Silver and Gold is like really Sufjan writing a bunch of new Christmas standards. I've said Christmas enough times that I might throw off if I keep saying it. So I'm going to move on from there. I'm not a Christmas <laughs> person, which is, you know, a, it's a testament to how good these records are, that I, I kind of hate Christmas. And yet I'm willing to put up with this indulgence because of how ridiculously fun it is. So you had that. Songs of Christmas and Silver and Gold. Yep. You have the Illinois B Sides album, The Avalanche, which is generally regarded as Avalanche. one of the best B Sides albums ever. Uh, and, and I just really let's take a second here to, to appreciate the fact that Illinois, a 22 song full double disc record, has a whole ass B Sides album that is generally regarded as one of the best of its kind Sufjan was not just cooking in this era Sufjan was was feeding the homeless you know Sufjan was Sufjan was was going for a fucking Guinness World Record in this era I absolutely thoroughly endorse the Avalanche uh, if you're a fan of Illinois the the b-sides are especially songs like Adlai Stevenson and Springfield Every alternate version of Chicago. <laughs> yeah, takes. it's a ridic- also worth mentioning. It is a B-sides album that is the same length as the original record. Ridiculously yep. fun record. There's also Sufjan's passion project soundtrack dedication to the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, uh, the BQE, which came out in 2009. Which I'll be honest and say I've never actually listened to in full. It's not particularly my brand of Sufjan but it 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 certainly showcases his massive skill in arrangements and it has the same spirit in those arrangements as artists like uh, Dan Deacon and any number of the massively ambitious modern classical indie artists of the time so that's worth checking out as well if you want to be a completist the next major release though is 2010's All Delighted People which is the EP that preceded his next major studio album. And of course, this being Sufjan Stevens, it is an EP in name only, in the sense that it says EP on the Mm. front cover, but it is also an hour long. And I'll get on my boat and say, this is fucking great. Like, this is one of my favorite Sufjan releases, just in general. I keep it out of my album ranking just for the sake of maintaining my sanity, and because it is kind of space for collecting hmm. odds and ends that Sufjan was had been working on while crafting Age of Odds but it is an utterly essential release not even like like if you're going through Sufjan you have to listen to All Delighted People there's two versions of the title track and oh, yeah. the original version of it is one of Sufjan's most accomplished compositions there's the one of my favorite acoustic ballads Sufjan's ever written Enchanting Ghost stunning song there's yep. the utterly bonkers ode to like parliament funkadelic era funk rock jam music with the 17 minute jaharia which the first 10 minutes of which is a guitar solo that starts and just never stops so fucking Um, awesome in a lot of ways all delighted people might be 
one of the most like ridiculously over the top releases in the Sufjan canon. It's consistently rewarding and surprising and fun. And yeah, I, I just, I thoroughly recommend it. I, it's absolutely one of my favorite EPs in general. Yeah, it's up there for me too. I would, honest to God, I think this would be a top 10 EP of all time. If not for the fact that like structurally, this is probably an overdone complaint, but like I kind of wish the classic rock version of All Delighted People was like a bonus track instead of like something that just kind of awkwardly slots in before the final two songs. It's like, it, it's not even that there's another version of it on there. It's just that like, why is this here? I, like, like, I like it. It's good. I just don't really like, when I listen to this, it's just kind of a strange flow to the experience that I don't feel like is super complimented by everything that surrounds it. But I mean, everything on here is absolutely great. I also want to shout out uh one of my stealth favorite Sufjan songs in the form of the absolutely beautiful and comparatively very very short oh, heirloom yes. yeah. um which i think is often overlooked just because of how small it is but honest to god a gorgeous gorgeous song this is an i agree with you on every front that this is an absolutely essential release that like its status is an ep who cares you yeah. need to listen i to was it. listening to it the other day and i think you know enchanting ghost might be one of the most underrated Sufjan songs ever like top 20 for me at least that's yeah. the thing about the acoustic tracks on this like Enchanting Ghost and Heirloom is that you know if you go back and compare them to something like Seven Swans you know an unfair comparison they're going for different things but like you can see how even in the humble goal of crafting a really intimate acoustic song he's evolved because you still have like layers of like electric guitar and just this really filled out mix that has so much dynamism in it and so much kind of weight and mm -hmm. accompaniment while still having that feeling of intimacy and straightforwardness. Uh, it's really remarkable how confident and comfortable he's continued to get as a composer more and more and more. Uh, and, and all delighted people is a good showcase for that. I, I get the fact that the EP feels a bit weird with both versions on it. You're not wrong. Uh, I, I love the classic rock version. To me, I think of it a little bit like the second disc of the first LCD Sound System album, where it's like the first disc is the album. Uh, but the second disc is also the album, but it's kind of just also an assortment of songs that aren't really arranged to flow with the record, but they're mostly really fucking good. And you get two versions of the song, yeah, just because they wanted to put two versions on there and they both fucking kick ass. And yeah, the first LCD sound system record is weighed down by having a random second disc of songs that don't flow as well as the first disc, but also there's a lot of fucking great songs on it. I'd rather these, I'd rather the classic rock version be on there in its weird state than not be on there at all. I'll compromise with you there. And so, yeah, and I mentioned how those acoustic moments are so breathtaking and so informed by this refinement and expansion of his sonic palette and that is realized so beautifully so tenderly and so understatedly in one of my absolute favorite Sufjan songs ever the first song on the next Sufjan Stevens studio album the age of arts futile devices Utah devices <laughs> i mentioned this song right now because as anyone who's listened to the album knows it kind of exists on a fucking island before everything else that happens on it uh -huh. and i think as a result of that it might be easy to overlook how utterly perfect every one of its two minutes and 11 seconds is a just stunning moment in time song of an intimate of a level of comfort and safety in the company of another person is something as simple as as feeling comfortable sleeping on their couch and being brought to the point where you a renowned wordsmith and incredibly verbose person are rendered speechless by your love and appreciation for this person it's a stunning song one of my absolute favorite sufian songs and it is a complete rug pull to go into the rest of the album from there because while futile devices is a song about comfort and safety and security age of odds is an utter fucking breakdown of an album it is the most fraught and personally 
catastrophic album Sufjan has ever made. It is the sound of a total identity breakdown. It's a complete cataclysm of panic attacks and dysphoria and crises of faith and feelings of inadequacy and basically every single personal dysfunction you could ever experience collapsed into this contorted bloated brutal screeching beast of a record it is my favorite thing he's ever done and it is terrifying jake how do you begin (laughs) with an album like age of odds what are your feelings on this mammoth record this is probably top three Sufjan for me um, because a the commitment is just there I'm both surprised and not surprised that this is the direction that he went in and that it is such a hard pivot because the the grandiosity the scale the the bigness the extraness of Illinois is here it's just channeled into this art pop indie tronic of mess of shit that he just like it sounds like he took all of like the synth tones from like you know kid a era radiohead and just put them through a filter and made them sound like uglier and weirder and just kind of scattered them throughout here but like that's the thing is what i love about this is that it's so so very carefully walks the line between being a complete and utter disaster of an album and something that feels structurally and sonically and just in terms of the compositions and arrangements perfect because everything here is specifically designed to evoke singular emotions out of you and i feel like it does that perfectly the album kind of again it starts off with futile devices and i love how that's the thesis statement for the album in no uncertain terms words are futile devices it's like he's saying that like what i say can only do so much so music is going to have to do for what i'm currently experiencing and then the rest of the album proceeds to prove his own point i mean it's hysterical that he starts with futile devices and then immediately goes into a song called too much like again haha Sufjan, you can't you could accuse him of many things having a not having a sense of humor is uh not one of them frankly and just every single thing about this hits uh i absolutely adore basically every single song on here but the highlights for me are the single i walked i think is a perfect sufyan song absolutely one of my favorites um i'm not even going to talk about impossible soul because i feel like you are going to do a fantastic job at putting any point i could make about that song for me but i will say that my favorite song on here is the penultimate track a top three sufyan song for me which is i want to be well this is to me, the ethos and just the emotionality of this album distilled into one perfect explosion of a song. This is the sort of the second half of the album. As it kind of spirals, it gets more and more focused in its intent to me, which is why the structure of it works so well. So it kind of purely distilling this essence of it in this one six and a half minute long track These are some of his most intense vocal performances. And again, he's a guy who that whispered double tracked vocal presence is like his trademark. So his really odd slanted vocal performances on here, they really ring as both kind of disorienting and really skillful. I feel like Sufjan as a performer is supremely undervalued just because of how often he steers towards being that kind of a uh, minimalist approach but on here it's just utterly spellbinding it's eclectic it's colorful it's all over the place it will not be for everyone but good god i am so glad that i have this album in my permanent lexicon now because it's so overwhelming that it manages to end up feeling calming to me and when i'm in a state of feeling overstimulated this manages to numb me like nothing else can There's a few aspects of the background of this album that I think are useful to mention in terms of both understanding the record, but also interesting contextual details that will inform a lot of Sufjan's approach to making records going forward. 
It's fair to say that Sufyan was extremely burnt out and deeply frustrated with the perception that had been established of him as a musician and the long-term wake of Illinois. This place that he occupied, the sense of who he was, he went through a number of personal crises, including a debilitating illness, and a developed at one point a fixation on the deceased visual artist Royal Robertson, who was a paranoid schizophrenic uh, with a, a deeply fraught and misogynistic personal history, and you know one of the most sort of bizarre figures in modern American art, a really fascinating person who deeply informed a lot of the visual and aesthetic approaches to this record as well, but also provided a, I guess, an analog for Sufjan in terms of a lot of the turmoil that he was experiencing as well. Uh, Roy Robertson's an artist who has a very bizarre relationship with faith and his work as well, believed himself to be a Lord Prophet and foresaw uh, destruction and apocalyptic decay you know, you can do a real, if you deep dive on Sufjan's inspirations and Sufjan's mindset going into this record, you could, it's a fucking rabbit hole, man. You could end up spending days down there. So Sufjan was frustrated with his artistic, with the perception of himself as an artist, the, the, the hanging anvil weight of the 50 States project um, as an expectation of him, uh, the box that he'd been put in musically and a, a series of personal crises that essentially made him want to basically screw up everything and completely confound as much as possible. And that is what the record does. It's generally regarded as a masterpiece now. I think a lot of people who've come to Sufjan after this, who've come on board with Sufjan in recent years, are more receptive to the bizarreness of this record than people were when it came out. This record was... It was positively received by critics, but it was largely treated with hostility by Sufjan's fan base when it came out. It took a long time for this record to really acquire the, the reputation that it has today. And it's understandable. I mean, it is a... It's one thing to call a record like this confrontational, which it is, but it's also just so abjectly self-excoriating and brutal and ugly and the product of someone who you know not that Sufjan is schizophrenic but it's it's not that much of a surprise that he's influenced by an artist whose schizophrenia was a huge part of, of their experience that they channeled into their art because it is a deeply uncomfortable album that reflects a deep sense of personal unrest the whole approach to the construction of of these songs Sufjan has no less skill and deftness in his compositional and his ability to kind of construct these sweeping compositions it's just that the toolkit he chooses to work with here is so abrasive so dirty so dingy so filled with kind of noisy squelches and 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 ephemera that it takes some serious adjusting to kind of fit yourself in the mindset to where you can appreciate what he's doing compositionally with all that shit it's an immensely claustrophobic mm. experience and the thing with the song like too much as well is it's like a it's a cute little pop song like cute little three minute pop song that's kind of engorged and swelled to this sort of six minute bloat of of squelching scrapes and and weirdly processed vocal chaos and yet it works because fundamentally there's a great song buried in there and the obfuscation of that core song by all of this noise works to enhance it as opposed to you know completely destroying it and that's something that's true of all the great songs on this record certainly the title track which is an utterly ridiculous piece of music i mean the the, the bombast of it kind of makes <laughs> you laugh out loud it's sort of stupidly <laughs> crazy just the 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 blaring horns and the weird sort of trilling woodwinds and just the the deep bassy groans are kind of hil hilarious in their own way but it's my god is it a fucking roller coaster of experience and yeah and you have songs like i walked as well which is a, again closer to too much 
in a sense that it's a kind of a, a, a cuter, more simplistic pop song that's given so much ridiculous orchestration that it feels like constantly stimulating. This is a great album to listen to if you have ADHD, I think, because there's never a, a moment on this record where you're not like getting that feeling of brain stimulation. Uh, I, I think a really underrated song is Get Real, Get Right, which is the biggest sort of conversation with um, oh, God, Sufjan's yeah. weird God faith complex. Not God complex, because he doesn't think of himself as God, but like his weird faith relationship where he's trying to pull himself out of this hole of, of complete ego death through his connection to God. And it turns into this fucking dance floor banger where he's basically screeching his need oh to, to reconnect with god while the entire song feels like a fucking cyclone is picking you up i fucking love this song so much and you have moments like all for myself and now that i'm older as well which are kind of like the aftermath of the storm moments where sufian is kind of in this depressive funk kind of trying to pull himself together uh now that i'm older i think he has one of sufian's most gut-wrenching vocal performances to me he is just spent on this song he's wailing and trying to pull himself together and the whole thing is just sort of untangled and eerie and pained and it really has a profound effect on me Vesuvius is one of the most emotionally cutting songs in the album as well a real climactic moment where Sufjan essentially tries to save himself in amongst the the worst most calamitous moments of his depression and you know i want to be well is of course the most chaotic song sufian's ever recorded it's a song that sounds more like the feeling of a complete psychotic break than anything i can i've ever heard it's physically overwhelming to listen to and it doesn't get any less effective in that respect the the more i i come back to it it's a genuinely dangerous piece of music for me and then impossible soul is a i mean what what more what, again like with those big songs on illinois what more can be said about impossible soul that hasn't been said before it is a unwieldy ridiculous indulgent magnificent messy progressive masterpiece that builds through five very distinct sections of music that are impeccably woven together it is absolutely the closest thing to like cassandra gemini that you will find outside of the world of over progressive rock mm -hmm. it has that same feeling yep. that that song has but of course in a completely different um you know emotional and personal context it has one of the coolest guitar solos i've ever heard in my life and it happens two yeah. minutes in to its 25 minute runtime it just you know mm -hmm. by the you're it, it's bewildering long before it reconstructs itself into a fucking cheerleader chant dance floor filler with one of the most uplifting choruses you've ever heard like 15 minutes into it and of course by the end of the song in its final section it's a complete collapse to the simplest acoustic melody and a mournful vocal conclusion uh, it is by far the greatest piece of music Sufjan has ever released, in my opinion. Not that he doesn't have other staggering pieces of music, but the sheer scale of what Impossible Soul is, combined with how much every second of it works and means to me, he'll. It, it's just the kind of thing that is once in a lifetime. And that's The Age of Ards. <laughs> a ridiculous album that profoundly means the world to me and of course Sufjan would continue to release strings of, of various side projects in the aftermath of this although it was certainly a period of decompression before we got the the next sort of five year wait for the next big masterpiece the one release in the interim that I'll shout out that I have the most personal fondness for is the collaboration 
with uh, the rapper Serengeti and the producer Sunlux in the form of the supergroup Sisyphus, which released an EP, Beacon Claw, in 2012, but in particularly a self-titled record in 2014 that is unquestionably one of the silliest things Sufjan's ever been involved in, but also I fucking love it. Serengeti's rapping is just hilariously bizarre. Sunlux's glitchy production creates a constantly unstable, but also like perfect compliment to Sufjan's soothing vocal performances. Uh, songs like Rhythm of Devotion and Booty Call and The Incredible Alcohol are some of my favorite Sufjan songs from this era. Uh, an, al- an album that I I cannot in good conscience recommend for someone who wants to hear a great album, but I absolutely fully recommend for someone who wants to hear three artists who don't give an absolute shit what anyone thinks being as weird as possible. And and even like aside from the collaborations as well, Take Me, the second song on this record, is one of the most beautiful uh, electronic Sufjan ballads ever so that, that that's absolutely a side project worth experiencing if you haven't but yes we go from illinois to age of arts to 2015's carry and lol which is yet another complete not reinvention necessarily but a kind of complete upending of what sufian is as a musician because this strips away all of the layers of, of noise and excess and volatility of Age of Ards to be a deeply intimate and devastating collection of stories that to a greater or lesser degree recount Sufyan's relationship with his mother, her passing, and the connection between Sufyan, his mother, and his childhood it's often been said that that Carrie and Lowell is stealthily the third state album because a lot of the songs are about experiences that Sufjan had with his mother when they traveled as a family to Oregon. So a lot of people refer to Carrie and Lowell as the Oregon album. But really, there's no record in Sufjan's career before or since that is structured that has the emotional tonality and that has the feel and style of Carrie and Lowell. It is a complete world unto itself. It's a masterpiece. It is a a brutally upsetting, achingly intimate and wonderfully tasteful collection of songs to sob your heart out to. I mean, Jake, what's your relationship with Carrie and Lowell? Uh, this is the only Sufjan album I heard before meeting you. So this is the one I have the longest relationship with and probably uh, one of the more deeper connections to. And the first time I heard it, I think I was really just the most captivated with its sheer raw beauty more than anything else that it kind of distracted me from how ugly a lot of the emotional content on here is it's both about grieving in a lot of respects and about you know Sufyan's past Sufyan's childhood Sufyan's relationship with his mother uh the aftermath of her passing the actual event of her passing and th- there there were moments where Sufyan could be kind of self-effacing or just kind of like raw in a way that made you deeply uncomfortable on albums like Age of Odds but on here I almost feel like that's doubled down upon to the point where the intimacy of this record forces you to confront the startling reality of a lot of the time where it, it just feels like you're hearing things that maybe you shouldn't even be hearing. And it's funny that I was so taken with how beautiful it was, considering how relatively stripped back it is. A lot of the vocals here were recorded on Sufjan's iPhone. Um, You can hear the setting in which he recorded some of his vocals on some of these songs. Uh, And honestly, that adds so much to the experience. But it also doesn't sacrifice... Sufyan's you know knack for scale because there are moments on here that really go for broke when it comes to how big they sound I mean the centerpiece track on here and I would say one of Sufyan's most beloved songs fourth of July which is I mean 
God, I I can't really identify that many songs that are about grieving or losing a loved one that affect me quite as much as this one does. I would say that my favorite moment in his entire discography up until this point is the final minute, which is this omnipresent drony synth sound that's just this wallowing, empty soundscape. And it sounds like being swallowed alive. It is terrifying. It is intimate. It is paradoxically comforting. But everything that comes before that, too, has just as much to do with this moment's strength as the moment itself. Uh, talking about the you know the 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 weeks leading up to her passing, talking about her in terms of uh, referring to her with these little like you know pet names of just like my little dove, uh, stuff like that. Just capitalizing on Sufyan's you know penchant for lyricism like this in a way that has just never broken your heart quite like this before and then that moment where you know it just immediately cuts in that final verse to uh her like the aftermath of her dying is just it's simply gutting and that's far from the only moment on here i mean like death with dignity the opener on here is fucking sensational like i mean the 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 opening chords to this song are enough to get me overwhelmingly emotional uh and I mean, like, th this, to me, just has the highest volume of perfect songs that Sufjan has made up until this point. Uh, whether it be the uncomfortable realness of something like Drawn to the Blood or No Shade in the Shadow of the Cross, where Sufjan's descriptions of things like self-harm so uncomfortable that I can barely even talk about them to recounting memories of his childhood or being abandoned in a supermarket by his mother, but also a very subtle arc about Sufyan's faith in God in the wake of the sort of experiencing this tragedy. And I feel like this element of the album goes severely underappreciated, uh, along with the fact that just like, again, the writing on here is so captivating, not just because it's raw or emotional, but because Sufjan as a wordsmith has simply never been sharper as a storyteller. Yeah, I mean, this is my favorite thing that he's made up until this point. To me, a lot of its virtues are kind of lost in the fact that it is very broadly about Sufjan losing his mother. And a lot of Sufjan's albums are inextricably linked to these terrible things that happened to him in a way that simultaneously sheds context onto the content of these albums, but also kind of swallows them in a way that I feel is kind of unfair to their actual contents and leaves some elements of them bizarrely unexamined in the larger sphere of music. So I simultaneously feel as though this is a towering achievement and some of the things about it are a little bit underappreciated in like the wider cultural conversation around it. That's a good point about Sufyan coming to be, particularly in the later eras of his career, associated so much with tragedy and you know in a kind of ironically awful way in attempting to demonstrate his versatility and shared as much of what was restricting him in the 2000s you know he ultimately struggles to escape being boxed in because that's just what people do with artists is they want to be able to understand them through the most accessible and simple lens possible and with someone like Sufyan it's so difficult to do that with without reducing so much of the music I also think as well this is a probably a different conversation but we, we don't need to get into today but there's like a throughout the 2010s as well I think in particular with young audiences with records like this and say Mount Erie's A Crow Looked at Me there is a strange yep. like yep fetishization of of grief in art that has yeah. led to these records being talked about and i think very restrictive ways you know and here's the thing there's a quote that sufian said about this album where it's like this is not an art project this is my life it's always stuck with me right because so much of sufian's work is viewed through this theatrical lens and you know it's an interesting counterpoint as well 
to a message that I try to push a lot, which is that, you know, when we talk about art, we should not project the artist's reality into the music beyond what we already know because a lot of people do that nowadays a lot of people take a work of art and say well this tells us this this and this about what the artist is going through and their life and their experience well this song is clearly about the artist doing this or that when we just don't have the grounds for that and Carrie and Lowell is like an interesting counterpoint to that where the artist is very boldly and very bluntly inviting you into something that is very real and autobiographical to what we can maybe assumed to be a painfully precise degree. And so I think, you know, the aftermath of this record has been a lot of people who connect with music like this, using it as a kind of template for how to approach art more broadly. And that's a, a different conversation, really. I won't, I shouldn't really go into it more than that, but it's interesting the effect that this album has had through no fault of its own, just through being a real raw, honest, and for Sufjan, very necessary expression of a real pain that he's gone through. It's come to, you know, and I'm not saying it's solely because of this album, but I feel like in a large part, this album has influenced the way a lot of people view art that specifically deals with grief. And as for Sufjan's relationship with faith as well i think there's an interesting and not often discussed parallel on this record between sufyan's relationship with god and sufyan's relationship with his mother the sense of what faith means of what belief without reward means of what love without condition means as well because sufyan's mother we gather through elements of these songs as someone who was not always well equipped to deal with parenting, who had a lot of you know difficult psychological issues that she went through and difficult life circumstances as well that made, again, this is from what we can gather from the songs and what Sufjan has said, you know, she's, she went through a lot as well. And so Sufjan growing up, having a, a parent who maybe wasn't always very reliable or always very present in his life came to have a certain expectation or came to build a certain relationship with her that allowed him to love her without always having that be reciprocated. And it's interesting how Sufyan, I think fairly subtly, but I do think it's there, builds a parallel between that love and his relationship with Christ, the sense of faith and belief and unconditional love that may not always be rewarded, but that still exists and it's still important for him, regardless of that reward or that reciprocation, because what it means is bigger than any kind of reciprocation. And so as the record goes on, in the wake of a song and like Fourth of July, where his mother's death is detailed so starkly, for the record to go into songs like John, My Beloved, and No Shade in the Shadow of the Cross, in which you know, particularly John, my beloved, which is one of my favorite songs in the record, where Sufyan directly yeah. addresses yes. Christ. Amazing. You know, that parallel, that sense with which that belief in her without reciprocation has now kind of reached its ultimate nexus because she is gone completely. She is as of the ether as Christ is. So the intensity of that belief and of the importance of that becomes so much more. It's a record that connects with a lot of people, not just because it captures that feeling of, of grief and loss and how we manage a grief and a loss that is difficult, that comes with a relationship that's tortured in a lot of ways, but also because it's an album that beautifully captures how so much of the faith that we all choose to have for a lot of us that we need to have, whether it's religious or not, is based so much in something that is really, if ever, going to be reciprocal. And 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 it's it's a record in that sense that is at its core about self-vulnerability and finding a way to persist and to live while understanding and embracing your vulnerability. Something that Sufyan was struggling with so much on Age of Arts, this vulnerability that left him so broken and frayed that feels like in some ways it's reconciled on this album. Um, it's it's very moving for that reason. I, I would say that it is even further strengthened when you go back and you look at something like Seven Swans and you look at a song like Abraham, 
where that song recounts the crisis of faith from a character in the Bible who is ordered to murder their own child as a proof of their resolve and an act of faith. And I feel like the, Sufyan's interest in this idea and particularly how it relates to a spirituality is planted far earlier on than Carrie and Lowell. And when contextualized through this lens, it just makes it more prominent and a lot more powerful. Worth mentioning, just as an aside, that there is a staggering live record uh, in which Sufyan plays this album in full, as well as a selection of songs from Age of Ards and a <laughs> quite funny cover of Drake's Hotline Bling. The whole thing is worth hearing. Uh, particularly as any Sufyan fan will gushingly tell you the live version of 4th of July in which that somber muted finale is a fireworks show of explosive dance euphoria completely reinvented. It's a staggering uh, document of the record. I know a lot of people who love the record kind of uh, treat the album itself and the live record as kind of complementary artifacts that are inextricably linked. So I would feel foolish if I didn't mention it. Um, it's worth hearing if you want to hear Carrie and Lowell in a different context that is no less devastating. I also feel like I should mention the Greatest Gift mixtape that Sufjan released in 2017, which is outtakes besides remixes from Carrie and Lowell. Uh, worth hearing as a curio, not quite as um, you know holistically structured as an album as something like The Avalanche, um, but still worth hearing, particularly for the enormously sweeping Wallowa Lake monster, which is, I understand why you didn't put that on the album. It wouldn't have Amazing. really fit on the album, but it's it's so worth hearing. Yeah. That song is just Titanic. You have also yeah. the single that Sufjan released, the Tonya Harding single in 2017, two versions of a ballad that Sufjan wrote for the infamous figure skater that happened to roughly coincide with the release of the I, Tonya movie. Both versions of the song are staggering. It is in the same way as all of Sufyan's songs that approach historical figures, filled with remarkable care, depth, and density in detail, but also in perspective on a divisive figure. It's not that Sufyan is condescending or frowns upon Tonya, and it's not that he hoists her up as a bastion of American exceptionalism. It is somewhere in the middle. It's a remarkably complicated song about a very complicated figure in modern American sports history that is obviously worth celebrating that song um, so I wanted to mention that and you also have a collaboration that I know means a great deal to you Jake the Planetarium album with uh, Bryce Dessner of The National and James McAllister and Nico Muley. Jake why don't you tell us a little bit about why you think this particular collaboration is such a standout in Sufjan's uh, discography I think that the next two projects that we're going to talk about embody how idiosyncratic of an artist he is and how that can have its limitations with certain people. And simultaneously, how if you latch on to certain albums in his discography, you can kind of be a little bit confused as to why there's a disparity in reception between other people's like evaluation of other records compared to records that you might latch on to more. Uh, so that being said, I think Planetarium is one of the best things Sufjan Stevens have ever made. And I both in theory get why it's not everyone's bag and also completely don't understand why other people don't love it as much as I do. Because on the face of it, yeah, it's a 75 minute long project. It's it's big. It's, you know, it's conceptual. It's not immediately apparent how this concept is actually being tackled. A lot of the criticism of this album revolves around its concept and how it should be, air quotes, executed better. And frankly, I kind of feel like this criticism misses the mark of the project on the whole in that it's not about talking about like each song represents like a planet like a planet or a you know uh an, an idea or a body in the solar system like uh you know the sun black hole the kuiper belt all of that kind of stuff 
and really it's not that these things are going to be explored through songs it's Sufyan's perspective on these things being explored through song so there are some songs on here that deal in the mythology I feel like this leads people to judge this and evaluate it as something that is disorganized or messy or conceptually fraught and to me I'm just like this is exactly how I want Sufjan Stevens to execute a concept like this. It's with his own personal lens and what interests him about this very broad idea. And that aside, musically, this is incredible. There is a diversity and a versatility to this project that I feel like, broadly speaking, really isn't found elsewhere within his career. It's just that these mixes and these songs have so much space space in them i mean haha ha, funny space but there is just like there's a lot of them that are super dynamic a lot of them that are super glitchy but sufyan's fundamental strengths as a songwriter are still all here but they're also really adventurous and cool moments i mean like the opening sort of stretch of like neptune jupiter venus and uranus i think is like one of the best runs of music that he has in his catalog and the closer uh actually the closing two uh the absolutely insane 15 minute long earth and uh the closer mercury are easy standout highlights for me particularly mercury which i think is like again top 10 if not top five sufyan songs this is again it's a little bit more out there it's a little bit weirder but like i can't tell you how many times i've just needed to like calm down relax myself become immersed in something and this is easily the album that I will go to to just dissuade the world around me. It's so absorbing. It's such a captivating experience and it has an appeal that I feel like is basically found nowhere else in his discography. Give this a shot if you haven't because I, I find the reception to it baffling. We're at an interesting point in Sufyan's career here because around the same time as well, Sufyan was invited to contribute to the soundtrack to Luca Guadagnino's Call Me By Your Name two songs mystery of love and visions of gideon both of which have become enduring oh. sufyan staples uh, sufyan performed very memorably at the oscars we all remember the pink suit it was a beautiful moment kind of stunning to be honest for anyone who'd been a fan of sufyan for a long period of time to see him in that position um and with the success of the film with the success of Sufyan's contributions came a new audience for him as well. Sufyan was more popular than ever and put in a very interesting position when it comes to following up would have become one of his most beloved records with Carrie and Lowell. And then we get that follow up in 2020 again, following the five year pattern, which has now been broken conclusively, but the last of the five year pattern albums, the Ascension came out in the height of the pandemic uh, just a few months into the tenure of a podcast you may know called Jams and Tea. Uh, we reviewed this bad boy uh, same week that Deftones came back with Ohms. In fact, it was a big week. And oh, boy, yeah. oh boy, is this an album. <laughs> boy, oh boy, is this a lot of album. I won't act like anyone who's watching at this point has seen our previous review. It's, you know, like a lot of our 2020 content, it's ridiculously long and all over the place. Like the album. Hey, hey. But... Mm -hmm. I will recap essentially what the gist of that conversation was, which was you guys expressing with poise and clarity and great detail, the general consensus surrounding this album, which was a mixture of bafflement, overwhelming saturation and disappointment, frankly, that a lot of people felt in the wake of this record. You guys expressed that, with great potency and fairness while I sat there trying to coherently express why I felt this was one of Sufyan's most profoundly affecting records ever. I was admittedly quite intense in my defense of that record. And I was really, really like, you know, in the perspective that we all find ourselves in at certain points when we, an artist we love releases a record that we think, wow, this is just an incredible work, something that's so significant for this artist. And yet people seem to be universally like cold on it or just not into it. And you're just in that position of being like, what is going on? Why is, and it wasn't that I didn't get why people were struggling with the Ascension. 
but I did feel really frustrated that I seemed to be the only person at that point in time anyway, who really connected with it deeply. And it was a struggle to explain why to kind of try and rationalize and justify why it worked or pointedly why it didn't work for so many people where other records worked for Sufjan. I think at the time I kind of maybe misunderstood something, which was that the coldness that greeted the Ascension from a lot of people was not really all that different to the coldness that greeted Age of Ards when it came out. You know, both really overwhelming, dense and fraught albums that a lot of people were like, this is not the Sufjan I like. This is not the Sufjan I listen. I come to his music for. This is a, a more upset, broken and complicated Sufjan who's like, you know, having a real like personal crisis. And I would like to come back to him when he has a very, you know, streamlined vision of what he wants to say. And, it, you know, and so a lot of the language and a lot of the general treatment of the Ascension I've now come to appreciate is really not that dissimilar to how Age of Ards was treated when it came out. And admittedly, Ascension is very deeply tied to the time where it came out for me. And I think for a lot of people as well, it is unquestionably a pandemic album. Not explicitly. It's not a record that explicitly refers to the pandemic at all at any point, but it's particular style of stir crazy internal turmoil that is also in contrast to the age of arts deeply informed by a cultural miasma that it existed within specifically the state of affairs of sufyan's beloved america all of that made it such a highly strung record that is exhausting as a proposition even before you sit down to listen to it now look, so if any artist has a license to bemoan the state of the American empire, it is the guy who wrote Michigan and Illinois, right? It is the guy who spent the early half of his career professing his love, appreciation, and understanding for the ugliness and beauty of an enormous country that has come to dominate all of Western culture, right? And so it's understandable and maybe even kind of overdue for Sufyan to reflect on the turmoil that that nation was in in the second half of the 2010s decade in his music. And to Sufyan's credit, like with all his grand cultural statements, it is only about America in as much as it is about himself and his own personal crisis. So I can understand why after that template having been established across a number of records for Sufjan, it can feel a little exhausting. It can feel a little bit like, oh yeah, Sufjan's in his bag again, except this time the target of it is so non-specific. Like it's, it's less Sufjan carefully, lovingly, and pointedly, you know, reflecting on specific aspects of American culture and more a broader bemoaning of the, the the general decay of that culture and specifically the decay of Sufyan's faith and all of the things that are a part of his identity his faith in god his faith in his country his faith in his culture Sufyan's not doing well and it's a bloated and ridiculous and ostentatious and ugly reflection of all of those things. It helps for me that I think it is certainly up until this point, the most lushly and pristinely produced album he'd ever put out. And it's a different kind of lush, pristine beauty than something like Carrie and Lowell, which is also immaculate in its soundscapes, but the synthetic electronic chaos realm of the ascension is so different and so much more pristine and pretty than something like age of odds which is deliberately murky and 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 you know saturated the ascension is a gorgeous album that uses the power of its prettiness to be ugly in a lot of ways i quickly connected with that dynamic of, of beauty and ugliness as well as the powerful introspection 
of songs like the title track, which is one of my absolute favorite Sufjan songs, and one of his most beautifully written confessionals, simultaneously tearing himself apart and also rebuilding his ability to be himself again. It's an album that asks a lot of you, and it's an album that is demanding because so much of it is a a personal crisis that Sufjan is experiencing and living through and putting out there for you across a you know ridiculous 80 minute runtime but like with all of Sufjan's longer more ostentatious more ridiculous records its excess is its character and it's never less than totally involving for me anyway it's also a riotously hard-hitting fucking juicy dance record with some utterly hammering ridiculous beats in songs like Ativan, uh, Landslide, Death Star. It is a cataclysmic apocalyptic trash fire of excess and I'm utterly irrevocably drawn to it even as I appreciate it may be and has been for a lot of people just a bit of a step too far and jake i think this is where you come in on this one i i gave it many more chances than i initially like would have because of your affinity for it and i was just sort of waiting to come back to this after i had explored all of his other stuff and I did explore all of this other stuff. And I purposefully left this to be the last thing because I wanted like the entirety of Sufjan's career to sort of contextualize this so I could get the most out of it that I possibly could. And I think I finally arrived at the point where I did get the most out of it. And I understand this record more than I previously did. And I love what I love on here uh, way more than I did in 2020, where I was just kind of like, yeah, some of these songs are good. Some of them are eh. But like, this does have some fantastic highlights. Very notably, I think one of my absolute favorite Sufjan Stevens songs in the form of Tell Me You Love Me. This has everything I want out of a Sufjan Stevens songs, particularly out of this era. Again, it's kind of got that sort of hard beats that knock thing that you uh, alluded to. There's a lot of electronic drums and percussion on this album that just hit real hard. Um, I think this is one of Sufjan's better vocal performances as well. Um, it just, everything about this album's appeal crystallizes on this one song, and it is the unquestionable highlight of the experience to me. Uh, followed very closely by the opener, Make Me an Offer I Cannot Refuse. Again, kind of a laying out of the groundwork of what the rest of the album is going to deal with conceptually. Uh, and, you know, that's not where the album runs out of great moments. I think, again, Adivan, banger. Love it. Absolutely fantastic. Landslide, one of the best hooks he's ever written. I love Landslide. It's fantastic. Uh, the title track, The Ascension, fantastic. This album is a lot less frenzied and extra than I remember it being. And maybe that's just me coming off the heels of really digging Age of Odds as much as I do. But like I talked, or when you were talking about the album, I mentioned how claustrophobic that record is. Here, on the other hand, could not be further from the truth. These mixes are wide. They are spacious. And I kind of think that this album, for as much as it does have a lot of like heavy electronic percussion and stuff, it leans a lot more into ambient pop than I remembered. And it, again, it, it lets itself breathe a little bit more. And I feel like this quality is a bit underrepresented in the discussion about it. There are lots of moments on here that just kind of work because of their sheer raw beauty. I actually agree in that this is maybe one of the most beautiful things that he's ever made. Uh, it, it all sounds fantastic. The problem I have is, well, the biggest issue, I guess, is that I, the second half of this, Oh man, I I it's 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 a trial to get through. Uh it's 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 really really tough frankly. After Landslide, there's a series of songs here that are just insanely uncompelling to me. Uh be it their lyrical preoccupations like uh, I th this is maybe the album of S Sufjan's that just thematically I get on board the least with just because his writing is very hit or miss when it's a little bit more internal. I'm with him when he goes 
more for bigger topics, I guess, and topical issues like on Death Star, for instance, could come across as kind of preachy and a little bit just, <laughs> I, I don't want to say surface level, but it's like, come on, man. Like, I I, I, I feel like there, there must be some sort of like thing that I'm still kind of missing here because it's just like, this is just not the level of depth that I'm used to with Sufjan probing topics like this. And I feel like there could have been slightly more of a concerted effort. Occasionally, some of these songs do feel like I'm just kind of scrolling on <laughs> Twitter. And I, 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 that, that, that sounds like insanely mean. It's still just the best conduit to represent what the slider moments on here are like. The stretch of Gilgamesh, Death Star, Goodbye to All That, and Sugar, all of the lesser moments on here for me are because the the structures of these songs are just kind of looping back in on themselves over and over again. Like, Lamentations, uh, Die Happy is maybe the biggest victim of this. Um, still an okay song, but uh, stuff like Ursa Major, again, it makes this album, which is already long, kind of make it feel like it's full of hot air occasionally and now that i like the stuff on here way more than i used to like you know the the high points on here it just makes this glaring contradiction way more present when i'm actually listening to it and i think the final kind of stumbling block of the album for me i don't really like america all that much Ooh, it feels like Sufjan's kind of trying to capture, at least musically and structurally, the lightning in a bottle that was Age of Odds and Impossible Soul again. And the hook that's, you know, repeated on here for the 12 minutes of America, the don't do to me what you did to America, it just doesn't have the same resilience that Age of Odds did. It also just kind of feels a bit trite and like musically it's pretty cool that's what pushes it over the line of still me still thinking it's good but it doesn't have the 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 power it doesn't have the color it doesn't have the the emotional immediacy and that's what i think really it boils down to is that this mo album's least affecting moments are because i just don't feel that much from them which is like really really rare for me with him I'm, I'm glad that i went back to this and appreciated a lot of it more but at the same time of his canonical releases very boringly this is the one that i hands down get the least out of yeah i mean look there's not much more i can say about the record i mean there's things that it does as songwriting devices like a lot of the record is about suvian attempting to kind of rediscover and unpack what it is about his cultural history that ever resonated to him by essentially exploring the feel of a whole bunch of american cliches like there's some like you know like how the, the song titles a lot of them kind of like evoke or reference other classic songs or there's lyrical motifs that are like you know classic cliches like the refrain in sugar for instance um and so a lot of it is sufian i think kind of trying to uh, unpack or or rediscover or or get to the heart essentially of of what his relationship is with his culture and what it actually means to him and also what his place is as well one of the things i find so compelling about sugar in particular is it is it's kind of blunt interrogation of what it is that people even want from Sufjan in the first place. He basically spends the whole song begging the listener to stop making him sing sad songs. And there's something in that, that really lands hmm. for me. And uh, there's so much like I age Vards is in a lot of ways, like an album about an, a personal individualized identity crisis. And Ascension is kind of an, an album about a creative identity crisis of trying to like figure out what it even means to you to be an artist anymore. Like when all of the things that you've built your artistic identity around are feel like more hollow and meaningless and shallow than they ever have before. And so there's a really interesting meta level that the whole album runs on where it's consistently Sufjan trying to figure out the point of doing any of it. And I think that that would be totally insufferable if it weren't for how well Sufjan resolves these conflicts with the last two songs. You know, this personal conflict of self with the Ascension and then this conflict between with, with the these two pillars of his identity, you know, his faith and his country in the closing track. 
so yeah it's it's a it's a it's a thing that i think works for very specific reasons that can also be the exact things that turn people off from it um but i'm glad that it still inspires such divisive you know reactions i hope it continues to do that because that i think the divisiveness of it the difficulty of it is where so much of its power comes from all right, that brings us to the present day. We, of course, had um, the collaborative record with Angelo D'Augustine, A Beginner's Mind, which came out in 2021. We reviewed that on the channel, a series of beautifully orchestrated songs that are, you know, essentially inspired by staples of horror movie history. Uh, a really unique project for Sufjan that's worth hearing. We weren't quite as into it as a lot of Sufjan fans were, but it is a really valuable curio um no point in really getting into it i think because we did review it pretty thoroughly let's get now finally after all of this build up to sufyan's latest release this is the ninth studio album from sufyan if you only count the kind of core pillar records and not any of the side projects or b-sides albums or any of the other things that he's done and as i kind of forecasted right at the beginning of this episode this is by some margin the most integrative work that Sufjan's ever created within that realm of his core records. This blends together elements of just about every single era of Sufjan as an artist sonically and it does it so like with such a diverse range of things that it is almost impossible possible to compare it to any one of his other records like on a moment to moment basis i can say for instance that the guitar on everything that rises sounds a lot like seven swans to me or michigan or i can say that like goodbye evergreen reminds me a lot of the ascension or i can say that you know my red little fox feels a lot like um, seven swans but kind of waltzy and filled out or i could do all these things to compare individual moments of this record to earlier things that Sufjan has done. But, you know, the more I was doing that internally throughout the week, the more, like, shallow those comparisons started to feel. Like, yes, aesthetically, you know, these individual things sound a little bit reminiscent of these specific parts of Sufjan's oeuvre. And that's valuable to think about, you know, how Sufjan has built a whole like arsenal of sounds and different you know expressions of who Sufjan is as a creative person at these different eras of his career and you know that's cool and interesting and that allows us for some context to look at this record and and what it means for Sufjan but also like in getting bogged down by this reminds me of this and this sounds like this and this is inspired by this and this is a logical extension of this you miss so much of what is so primarily powerful about this album in itself which is one of the most concise and effortless seeming collections of songs that Sufjan has ever released an utterly spellbinding record that is somehow completely par for the course in terms of what we've come to expect from Sufjan but also kind of bewilderingly brilliant for this far into his career and with such a degree of like non-innovation you know what i mean the kind of praise that this has been met with and the kind of momentousness that this occupies feels like it should be true of an album that is in some way completely new for sufyan as opposed to one that is so like sufyan type beat throughout the entire thing like it's so sufyan being sufyan and yet it feels primal it feels urgent it feels new you know it is it is the old made new part of it i think comes from as has often been the case with sufyan as we've discussed with the last three major studio albums real life context adding whether sufyan intends it to or not a degree of emotional heft and primacy to the work before it is even consumed it's notable that in the lead up to the release of this album, Sufjan revealed that he's been suffering from and getting treatment for Guillain-Barre syndrome, as well as what was reveal, revealed only on the day of release of the record, which is that in April of this year, um, Sufjan's partner, Evans Richardson III, passed away. 
we have no way of knowing. And I want to, especially, you know, given what I said about Carrie and Lowell, I want to emphasize, we have no way of knowing the degree to which either of these things fed into the album. It's in fact entirely possible that both of these things happened after the album was complete. We don't know. It is, though, still irrevocable context that because of the time that information was revealed has influenced the way that the album has been talked about, the way the album is situated, and particularly the way the album has hit people. And I'm sure I include all of us in that to one to a certain extent, because it is an incredibly emotional album. And that almost feels like a, a stupid thing to say about a Sufjan album at this point, because when has there ever been one that isn't like ridiculously wrecked in its emotional intensity? But really, this is like, okay, so we have Sufjan's Identity Crisis album with Age of Arts. We have Sufjan's Grief album with Carrie and Lowell. We have Sufjan's cultural artistic identity meltdown with Ascension. And here we have Sufjan's breakup album. These are fairly easy songs to read as breakup songs, not exclusively, but it is the lens that I think most obviously offers itself to these songs, many of which are about love falling apart or love in strife or love at its end. So on one level, Javelin immediately is easy to connect with because it falls into a history of tropes you know the breakup album is a well-established trope in rock music history specifically but just popular music history in general and javelin feels it, like it offers itself into that canon on one hand but also it appears to offer an updated insight into sufyan's state of mind that is more down to earth more modest, more humble, and more elemental in its emotions than the Ascension was, and than anything he's done since Carrie and Lowell has been. I'm curious, I'll, I'll shut up now. What do you guys think of, of this record? I know you've both connected with it deeply. Why is it that you've connected with it deeply? What is it about this record that feels like, especially because we're, you know, this has been universally lauded, what is it about this album that you feel is so immediately attractive and compelling and powerful. As emotional as Carrie and Lowell was, what strikes me about Javelin is its ability to flatten me in the same way while maintaining the sonic ambition of Illinois in a much more lean runtime. I'm sort of intellectualizing my response to it, you know, and couching it in these sort of big words and comparisons. And the, the the simple fact of the matter is that this is easily the most I've connected with Sufjan's work musically and the in the bits of lyrics that I ha that I do pick up on. You know, it's it's one of those albums that just the enormity of it is difficult to reckon with. A week on, it's one of the shortcomings of our format. Cause like I <laughs> Just imagine talking about Carrie and Lowell week after it came out. Yeah, what are you going to say um, that's like enough? It's sort of putting the density of his most ambitious works with the emotional intimacy of his most intimate works into one package that is lean and never lets off the gas being deeply rich and emotionally evocative for a second of its runtime. With basically every listen that I gave to Javelin since it dropped and, uh, well, a little before it dropped, too. Um, Stop, thief! I got a hold of it before it technically came <laughs> out it, because guess. this is, again, another one of those albums where you need to spend a lot of time with them before talking about just to grapple on even your vaguest thoughts. So... Knowing that I could get ahead of the curve a little bit, I did. That said, I didn't know a lot of the context of the record until the day that it actually came out. So keep that in mind. But judging by the amount of Last FM scrabbles that I have on this album, uh, I listened to it around 17 times. I... <laughs> 
paradoxically kind of became less and less sure how I would talk about it because it's an album that was already kind of loaded when we found out about Sufjan's illness and it was also you know compounded 50 fold once we found out about Sufjan's partner and in the days leading up to it I got a hold of it and without that context I found the album quite confounding not at all in like a negative sense like the musicality and the palette on display really like captivated me as most of Sufjan's stuff usually does, but maybe even more intensely than it ever has before. But something about it remained elusive. I did know about him being in recovery and in physical therapy. So there were moments like on the song Shit Talk where he refers to feeling atrophy or running start where the song explicitly rewinds time and he refers to his body moving in mystic ways. So initially my read on the record was that Sufyan was kind of taking his often multi-layered, occasionally jagged metaphors that mask something intensely personal and applying it to recovery, spiritualism, and healing. The opener, Goodbye Evergreen, at first, to me, read very obviously as a song where he essentially said goodbye to his youth, the days of feeling evergreen, so to speak, embracing the pain of the future with a wistful, thorny goodbye. And now that I have the context, I still feel as though this reading applies, but it hits very differently. More broadly, what Sufyan is saying is goodbye to security. The security that comes from love, from casting aside your mortality, and yes, from a brighter, younger past. It's colored somewhat even further by knowing Sufyan's past through his previous music, knowing that he achieved this evergreen status despite suffering the loss of his mother, dealing with thoughts of self-harm, intense bouts of anxiety, general self-hatred, which makes the pill that this gives you so much harder to swallow. The bits of electronic, almost IDM-style ephemera that the opener explodes into is so initially disarming. It, it really took me off guard the first time it happened. Like, I was into it, but I was just kind of like, whoa, what? It still takes me off guard. Like, Riley and I have been talking about how occasionally on, like, some of his more recent albums, the the rhythmic aspect of Sufjan Yan's music is being more pronounced and, like, more colossal in terms of its, like, impact on you. And that's that hasn't changed. Like, I can only describe it as, like, immense sounding. And the chorus of woodwinds near the end is just so exploratory in a way that I've never really found his music to be. I found it often scattered. I found it disarming. I found it focused, intense, personal. But I've never found it to be kind of wandering, like, conducive to the idea of just sort of marinating in it. And I, I'm curious, actually, how maybe you two read how this song progresses in its second half. And I guess more broadly, the way that this album tends to ebb and flow between traditional folk song structures and the more esoteric bits of colorful instrumentation that are more typical of his Age of Odds and mm. Onward work. Yeah, there's a like a continual fusion of, you know, these sort of ornate, almost like antiquated folky arrangements and these brusque heavy dance beats and electronic music affectations that brush up against each other so frequently that it's clearly done with purpose to kind of push both of these you know what would generally be regarded as very different aesthetics into conversation with one another and you can analog that however you want you can say you know a there's a past and present analog with those collisions of aesthetics or you could you could take any old thing or antiquated thing and new thing uh dark thing somber thing and bright thing you can make any kind of analogy there you want but there's so many aspects to the way that contrast and sort of things that sound like they shouldn't belong together are put together throughout this album that you get a, a real like intuitive sense of the record being about some kind of confrontation with uh, a thing that was and now isn't whether it's a uh, childhood relationships whatever as for goodbye evergreen first time i heard this i 
burst into tears. <laughs> it was a weird burst into tears response as well. Like when I burst into tears, I don't like, you know, I'm not like, you know, some old lady at a funeral. I'm like, I just have this physical response I can't control. Is the complete tidal wave of emotion when the song fully drops. That's what I mean when I'm saying like every emotion at once. It is so completely overwhelming that like there's some sort of physical response yeah. the song demands it, it's almost physical before it's emotional you just kind of feel it like it's a gut yeah. reaction like you've been tapped in the knee and your reflexes well, the, the, and of course whoosh. there's always there's already a a sentimental tragedy to the lyrics before it even the song even gets to that you know everything heaven sent must burn out in the end is a you know it's a that's a fundamentally heartbreaking line like the idea that something you know ordained by god you know this beautiful thing inevitably has an ending imprinted upon it i promised you just as you were in my dream now let me off easy and i'll slip down through the drain to release my scattered brain you know the the record's already starting you off honestly in a not dissimilar place to how carrie and lowell starts off with uh, the sentiments of death with dignity but it wasn't even that like that's not new for sufyan that's not surprising it was when the song drops, so to speak, when those incredible detuned synth bass hits come in, there's something about them, like that, th how atonal they are, how like crushing and bleak they sound, you know, against this almost ironic, you know, choral refrain of the title of the song. It just devastated me. Like, it just made me feel hopeless. But also cathartic, obviously. It, it's a moment of immense catharsis, but it's a catharsis that's given to you in this really bitter sound. And I was not expecting it. I, I didn't think the record was going to give me a moment that was like this at all. So, yeah, it really blindsided me, you know, with that continual refrain of, of, of the title of the song and You Know I Love You. Sufyan's assertions of love and the recurring motif of how important love is to him, both to express and to be uh, received, is like the biggest thread of the album. It is a it is a record about not just the power of connection, which is such a cliche thing to say, but just like how fundamental to his sense of identity and self and sanity love is. And then for the, the way the song changes in the final stretch as well, I, I think I resonate most, Jake, with your initial interpretation of reading the song as a goodbye to a childhood, like a, a growing and a making peace with the past. And the final section of the song feels freeing in that sense, like that exploratory thing you described I, I completely resonate with that because it does feel like suddenly a burden's been lifted and the woodwinds feel light and and genuinely pretty. The song opens up, you know, it has that backing of a like genuinely heavy dance beat that kind of comes in um, to kind of push it forward. But it is genuinely sort of open-ended and sprawling in a way that feels like it's full of possibility. And so, yeah, the song really is just like the weight of a loss of love that's chosen but no less painful for having to make that choice and then a burden that's lifted and you know as a result of that going into a running start the Sufyan feels alleviated it's lighter than ever it's a a, a gorgeously open sounding song in comparison there's one thing I want to touch on that, Riley, you mentioned the choral vocals being a really present element on Goodbye Evergreen. And that's one of the ideas on here that pervades the whole album that I found really striking because this isn't a new thing that Sufjan's doing. Like they do very nearly kind of create a, a gospel like feel on certain songs, which, you know, it's in keeping with Sufjan's preoccupations with faith. But I think that their employment on here kind of runs a little bit deeper, particularly when you contrast it with Carrie and Lowell. That record's probably the most interesting to compare this to in regards to how each talks about loss in a broader sense not not even necessarily explicitly grief but loss in particular 
like Carrie and Lowell is very much dominated by Sufjan's, you know, trademark whispered double track vocals, which creates a level of intimacy that pervades that experience. You'd think that he would maybe try a similar approach again when talking about an album that's on at least a comparable emotional wavelength. Now, I don't feel like that's the case. To me, it's actually kind of simple. The choral vocals make Sufjan feel as though he is less alone. He is attempting to commune with something greater, like something spiritual. And I would argue that this choice works heavily in the record's favor. Carrie and Lowell kind of snugly hides a very distinct arc about Sufjan's faith and relationship with God in the wake of his loss. Whereas here, it feels like Sufjan's directly addressing the idea of what I think is my biggest read on the album, which is about Sufjan's own mortality. It's less about being left behind and more about wanting to move forward, even if moving forward means death. Just like on like a song like Will Anybody Ever Love Me, which we'll get to, he talks about being sent off into the beyond, like the harmonies from the choral vocals that feel comforting. They're cushioning the thorniness of the album in something pillowy, something familiar. And they brush up against the more cacophonous, like large scale moments, like on Goodbye Evergreen. It's a it's a musical coping mechanism, but it feels like Sufjan himself is he, he feels as though he isn't totally alone. It's affirming like a lot of the sentiments on here. And so whenever they are absent from a given song it allows you to be in the moment forced to reckon with the intimacy of something running start i think is one of the most playful songs on the album um it builds off of that exploratory sense that you end off the opening track with into this almost whimsical like not silly but just this really uplifting place it comes through and the accompanying vocals it comes through in the um, guitar melody it comes through in some of Sufjan's writing as well if I align myself with Pisces in a funny way can you my lover kiss my bracelet and my shoulder blades again a lot of intimate writing specifically in terms of talking about uh, a physical connection you throw your arms around my heart a pair of eyes and a gentle breeze the time has come to ask for a kiss it's a very simple and very beautiful song about the importance of love to Sufjan and of the the feeling and the sensation of being loved. It's a simple thing, but Sufjan is able to bring so much whimsy and joy to it that you almost forget how heart stomping the opening song was. And so I suppose mm -hmm. this this experience of love and being loved and the inherent relationship that love like life has with loss is ever present on the entire record it's not something that's mired in these brutal realities of the end of a relationship or of a loss it's always connecting that loss back to how important and how significant and how powerful the love was and is to him and and you know and that is no more openly stated than in will anybody ever love me which you know there's a kind of song that this as soon as you hear it you recognize this is a classic song i didn't even mean for sufian i just mean like you put a song you hear a song sometime and you're like this yeah. is one of the great songs in the history of songs <laughs> and that's what this is mm -hmm. every lyric the melody the vocal line the way that the song surges in the chorus every element of its construction it's all great like so many sufian songs are but there's just that extra something on this that makes me think shit man this is a standard a, a future standard just came out and i just got to hear it i mean it's the ability that so many great songwriters have and so many great songs have to make you feel like you're hearing something plaintive and simple and beautiful for the first time while also carrying the torch of so many great songs that it clearly is influenced by the idea of like a new standard is what came to my mind as well. The he hits the 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 title phrase, uh, and then the love me. There's the love me, and like that's it's just a little the the and sauce it, that the is thrown in there. To my heart, that little thing he does. It's a power to say something so simple and almost trite. Will anybody ever love me? But make it feel like it's the first time anyone's ever really said that 
the digital hi-hat running in the background puts it as like a contemporary production but it like it's not difficult at all to imagine Emmy Lou Harris singing a more lo-fi <laughs> version of it in some realm where the song was channeled from the ether much yeah. much earlier and what I love about it is that yeah it, it orients itself around that very simple like universal expression but it's still so loaded with Sufjan's like wicked darkness as well i mean the first verse he talks about being tied to a wooden raft set on fire and pushed into the void and like the the gravity of that barely registers when you're listening to it you just see it so like plaintively and prettily hello wildness please forgive me now for the heartache and misery i create take my suffering as i take my vow wash me now anoint me with that golden blade Bro, just yes to all of it. <laughs> to me, this section of the song is really it's it's forecasting a lot of what the the final leg of the album does, but it's Sufyan contemplating mortality because he wants to kind of push himself into the great beyond because he wants to commune with the spiritual, whether or not that's because he wants to sort of absolve himself of the struggle of his faith or to get back maybe something that he has lost or someone that he has lost he wants to feel closer to that like a lot of this album i think sneakily is kind of about suicidal ideation in the way that lots of topics of sufyan steven songs are hidden and nestled within other sentiments that can easily be read as other things but to me, like this part here is like him just sort of wanting to experience a kind of like martyrdom, both like physically and spiritually in order to push himself away from the physical world just because he is tired of wandering. The, the core sentiment, will anybody ever love me? That sort of feeling you get if you're not immediately like in a relationship or if you've lost someone, like you just have this sort of aching feeling of like wandering about and just being like is someone going to love me and it's like Sufyan views love and can't separate it from death he's like it, it is impossible to separate these two concepts from the point of view of which he's singing and it's it's intrinsically linked to one thing love will eventually mean loss and that's exactly what uh you know converge that's what that sort of song is is getting at that's sort of the the meeting point of these two sentiments these you know love and death but like he just so desperately wants to be able to experience the best part of life that he views without the worst part of life without saying goodbye and it's sort of the beginning of the the true arc of the album for me which is learning to let go of the fact that everything does rise and everything must converge it's i mean it's kind of been a preoccupation of his for ages i mean you go back to chicago off of illinois the all things go refrain he particularly dwells on the nature like literal nature on this album lyrically and the way that you know all things go uh the impermanence of everything in particular the impermanence of love that's what makes the title of the song so powerful. Will anybody ever love me? It's just that there is an inherent tragedy in the fact that you have to keep asking yourself this question every time something bad happens to you. This sentiment's going to come back over and over and over again. And it's like, no matter how many times you have to deal with something, dealing with it again is not going to be easier. But it's also like, you keep asking the question because the answer to the question is always inescapably yes which is beautiful and terrifying and it makes my my brain pour out of my Ooh, ear holes <laughs> so like the 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 optimism is inherent to the song and the message at its core but the reason that it has to be asked over and over again is because mm -hmm. everything is impermanent it's important to remember as well that for Sufyan again at least through the music through the art Love is inextricable with devotion and faith specifically. Like Sufyan is someone who values his faith and values his devotion to his faith above most, if not all things. And so Sufyan's understanding of, we talked a lot about, you just throwing that word love around, Sufyan's understanding of love and Sufyan's expectation of love is clearly informed by 
the way he's come to understand it through the lens of faith. You know, love is devotion for the sake of devotion. The fact that it can be done is the reason to do it. And you don't expect anything from it because that's not the point. That's not why you do it. But yet when you do devote yourself because you are human and because you are self-aware and because you have a sense of yourself and desires and wants, and because you are vulnerable, you do inevitably want that love in return. You do inevitably want and need and have that desire for it to be reciprocated even as you, as a faithful person, devote yourself to Christ without expectation. I want to jump ahead for a second because we talked a little bit about this relationship between love and loss. I want to jump to the title track of the album for a sec because I feel like there's a, I mean, this to me is one of the most profound lyrics I think that Sufjan's ever written about love which is um, searching through the snow for the javelin I had not meant to throw right at you, for if it had hit its mark, there would be blood in the place where you stood. I've been thinking about that all week. This idea that putting your love out there, projecting love, making someone or something the target of your love, when that love is so powerful that it, it could kill them, it could literally bring about their end. So how do you project all this love that you have how do you put all this love that you have out in the world without ultimately causing hurt causing pain causing destruction and the song within that one lyric like presents that idea for Sufyan that he can't fully express his the 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 real fullness of his love and devotion without worrying that he will destroy the thing that he's targeting it with And when you think about that idea in the context of will anybody ever love me, you realize that yes, for Sufyan, devotion and destruction are hand in hand because you allow yourself to receive love knowing that it may destroy you, knowing that the loss that it comes with inevitably may be the thing that completely ends you. So yes, love and loss are so inextricably tied and the title track, which comes late into the record, I think is one of the most explicit moments on the album in terms of drawing that connection and bringing it out into the ether. So I wanted to allude to that because I feel like that song informs a lot of what we've been talking about, about how powerful this love is. To me, that's why this album's tentative status as being an album that could be about grief or it could be a, you know, a more straightforward breakup album both matters and doesn't because it's the same thing the no matter what you read it as it's the loss of love that 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 is what matters that that that's that kind of sort of metaphorical flexibility i mean has decorated sufyan's entire career up until this point but to me it's not just a a way to read a specific song it's the crux Mm -hmm. of the album to me and one of the reasons i find it so powerful is that there's a little the whole record to me kind of flows beautifully as sort of demonstrating this concept, but there's a kind of arc specifically that begins with the song before Javelin, which is uh, So You Are Tired, if I can leap to that for just a moment, which is the best song Sufjan Stevens has ever written. The way that this song frames Sufyan kind of breaking up with the person that he's losing, he paints himself as childishly holding on to what they have, viewing their departure as like a personal slight or a cruel joke that's being played on him. He feels as though giving in to death is erasing what they had. Leaving him is erasing what they had. In many respects, it is a deeply ugly song about the worst aspects of grief or being left in the wake of heartache. And it's what turns you into, as you just want to hold tightly onto whatever is leaving you. And it can cause you to directly blame somebody without any agency in the matter. It, it, It progresses so beautifully into Javelin, as you said, Riley, like it's a haunting moment of realization where Sufyan realizes his childishness and that childishness has wounded the person that he loves and defeating the purpose of holding on to what they have in the first place. And that to me is just like, there's such a 
fantastic level of self-interrogation there that really kind of digs deep into the maw of ugliness that Sufyan has been like really mining ever since Age of Odds to me where he's like willing to present himself in a very deliberately unflattering light in order to thoroughly expose which I think takes a certain amount of bravery as a songwriter just like regardless of the level of like truth to your own given experience it's like to to paint yourself or the narrator like this and to challenge your audience in that way it's a deliberate obfuscation that risks like alienating how a listener might necessarily feel or identify with and if we want to go back to like viewing the songs more in order it kind of links back to a sentiment that's in the song genuflecting ghost which to me has one of the most beautiful like plucked guitar melodies that i mean sufyan's ever arranged it's it's gorgeous it's a fantastic song genuflecting ghost i kiss the floor rise my love show me paradise nothing seems so simple anymore he wants to sacrifice himself in order to get back that which he could lose or that which he has already lost and genuflection as a, a point of like focus for him on here is interesting because genuflecting of course is a specifically religious context in which that is put it's like genuflecting is getting down on one knee specifically before god in an act of devotion or worship it's like he is begging god give this to me like you know actually it really reminds me of something that you said about the mitski album the other week riley when you were talking about how she was like i want to give my soul to be rid of my soul to me that's what sufyan is more or less saying on here like the way that he just explores this by like it, sort of fantasizing about how what his sacrifice will achieve the rest assured empires will fall insecure restless and small sacred word bind me insult as i praise your name dancing in our catastrophe ramparts in the sky the flash with horror let's take these chances no more amnesty it's like he's he's so desperate not to lose this that it doesn't matter what he has to sacrifice even if it is himself his devotion goes so far it just it transcends logic itself, because if he sacrifices himself, he won't be able to experience it. But at the same time, that's how intensely he feels about it. And it's just. Uh, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot to handle. I like that you brought up. So you retired and genuflecting goes together because I do think they kind of inform each other. You know, this perspective, this vulnerable self-victimizing perspective that Sufyan presents himself in and so you were tired it's interesting the kind of link that he makes between his relationship with god this this position of genuflection that he puts himself in this position of subjugation of, of self it's not demeaning for Sufyan which is an important distinction but it is a position of of subjugation that he puts himself in in order to appease God in his mind, at the very least. And it's interesting how that parallels the way he behaves in this relationship context, where, you know, this dynamic of his relationship with God, of genuflection, of begging, of, of putting yourself down, essentially, so that you can hold them up. You know, how that is then reflected in this relationship dynamic that he casts himself in of of almost, well, not even almost, of quite sort of pathetic longing and attempting to appease something that is clearly beyond his control. It's, you know, it's emotionally, it's a lot. Um, and so you retired, you know, I mean, I've listened to songs so much this fucking week. I mean, my God, if there is the soundtrack to aching, it's just... just it aches so much. I can't stop listening to it. It is just wrenching. I don't have as much to say about um my little my red little fox, which sits between them, other than to say, uh, it's a beautiful song. There's like a kind of frosty electric piano, or maybe it's a stringed instrument of some kind that comes in to lay the main melody down through the song, and it is one of the prettiest sounds I have heard on an album all year. Uh, it's also um, a beautiful like waltz as well, a, a structure you don't typically get from Sufjan. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful 3-4 shuffle that just makes you feel very cozy and, and comforted and cuddled up. 
as Sufyan again opines and, to be held and kissed and saved. It's it's a very comforting and very sad and very human thing. It's what Morgan kind of alluded to earlier when he pointed out that there's a lot of instances of Sufyan combining nature, the natural world, and kind of fusing it into the thematic core of what he's talking about. And to me, it's like here he's sort of singing to nature as though it is the thing he well, loves or the thing he loves as though it were nature talking about i think it's even more than that because like it, it, it echoes for me the the title of the song it feels like a very conscious echo of carrie and lol yeah well also just the fact that you know in that song sufyan and his mother both referred to each other with these names you know, these little affectations of, of, of animals, right? Little animal, little dove, little meadowlark or whatever. So, you know, it feels in a certain sense like maybe this is a song where Sufyan communes with, not necessarily his mother, but just it's a song that I think is through that connection, whether you pick up on it or not, is evoking a, a conversation with or a connection with something that is gone, uh, which is in keeping with the rest of the record as well. But it is this moment of looking to connect with, looking to be comforted by something that isn't there, that is gone, that may be fruitless. But the the pining itself, the reaching out, is is just a, an important part of the process for Sufyan therapeutically. He has to do that. He has to go through that. And it doesn't matter what it yields, whether it ends up solving his drama or, or whatever happens. It's just a thing he has to do. The most comforting moment on the album for me it's just him taking refuge through this communication and melding these multiple ideas of trying to reach out to what's lost but like still treating it as though it's there like a lot of the songs here i feel like can be read as a gesture that's a bit more futile maybe sufyan is in denial about some of these things and he's working through it by you know acting as though these things are you know more direct than they maybe are but that's just really a speaking to the versatility of the writing here that it can be read multiple ways but i think that aspect of it is maybe at its strongest at something like this or on on the next song after that i'm not someone who's experienced grief in this way but I know that many people who experience a very devastating loss, so someone very close to them, the loss itself almost paradoxically becomes a presence in your life. And though the person or thing that you've lost is, is gone forever, and you understand the permanence of that, they continue to be a presence in your life, and you continue to engage with them as a part of yourself long past that loss. And it's not a delusion. It's not mm -hmm. you trying to, you know, convince yourself they're not gone. It is just that they continue to be a presence actively in your life, even though they are not there. And you engage with them in whatever way, whether it's like actual conversation or whether it's just a feeling of, of being accompanied by whatever remains of that person. And so my Red Little Fox to me, like, it feels like, and it's not the only moment, but I think a lot of the ways that Sufyan engages with loss is as a presence in his life that is a part of the way he lives day to day and a, a thing that he engages with. And I'm sure for, for people with faith as well, for people with specific afterlife beliefs rooted in faith, there's an extra dimension to that that no doubt plays a huge part into you know, how Sufyan writes these songs or maybe what they mean to him. All that ephemeral stuff though is largely cast to the side for what is my favorite song on the album and and ostensibly the climax of the record the eight minute shit talk which is as overwhelming of a piece of music as Sufjan has ever created what okay so all this ephemeral stuff about loss and presence and all that kind of shit and longing that we've talked about this is such a cutting song. It is so direct. The language of this song, even from the choice of how it's titled, but everything that's expressed in the song is like a person-to-person -person sentiment, right? It's a communication from I to you. You know, the song has multiple refrains that Sufyan lands on and hammers home, and that often are picked up as well 
by the army of beautiful backing vocalists that we've alluded to who are so present across this album. It's a fucking, if there's one thing that defines this album in terms of like an actual tangible aspect of it, I would say it is the vocals Uh, more than anything else. They're so there all the time, Mm -hmm. you know, in a way that almost reminds me of I'm easy to find, honestly. Fitting considering Bryce Dessner is on this song. Well, yeah, but also just the way that the backing vocalists are as much of a presence in expressing the songs as Sufiana's. That's true of I'm Easy to Find in an even more like overt way. But yes, so, so Shit Talk is like an ultimate sort of climax of the album, a communion between Sufyan and whatever it is, whoever it is, whatever the thing is that he is addressing, where all of these additional voices, these female backing vocalists, you know, are are one with him and expressing these things. And at certain points as well, when he can't even sing anymore, they pick up the slack. And just the the way that these refrains are chosen on the song, the first one being, I will always love you. The second one being, hold me closely, lest I fall. And the third one being, I don't want to fight anymore. I don't want to fight at all, excuse me. That slow movement from from devotion to desire to desperation between these three uh different refrains that are like in the first third the second third and the final third of the song it's a mountain of emotions it's everything i think that the one moment where sufyan who is in such a hushed mode vocally for the whole record. There's a one moment where he just kind of like slips into a falsetto. And I think I can feel the, the valves of my heart giving out at that moment. Like I'm just, (laughs) I can't, the blood isn't moving inside of me anymore because it's all functionally fallen away to the way that the song just, you know, after that falsetto moment, again, the voices come in, they pick up for him, and it's just this cascade of overlapping lines of vocals as the whole thing just surges forward to the, you know, restrained, mournful outro that's so reminiscent of the way Blue Bucket of Gold ends, where the vocals just fall apart Mm -hmm. and it's just this wave of ambient sounds. Man, I'm I I I I've said all I can say about this shit, man. It's just he he must have put like a surprisingly beautiful and plaintive cover of what's generally regarded as the worst song on Neil Young's Harvest at the very end of the album, just to kind of give you a bit of grounding. <laughs> the thing that makes shit talk so powerful to me, the fulfillment of a three song long arc where again i kind of alluded to it starts with so you were tired where sufyan again childishly kind of admonishes the person that he loves for either leaving him or dying and then having what they had together evaporate and then javelin is the kind of harsh realization of oh my god i hurt this person Mm -hmm. and then shit talk is the absolution of that it the 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 lyric on here that gets me the most is just the I will always love you, but I cannot live with you. It's the single most powerful line on this record. It's not just because it represents the completion of the arc of acceptance, but because it's a dogged refusal to give in to Sufyan's desire to die that he's expressed on the earlier parts of the album, to to be a part of the greater beyond, to escape the pain of the present. It's less suicidality and more a willingness to take his place in the cycle of the universe. It's something more spiritual, as the I cannot live with you is a refutation. It's a paradoxical line. It means I cannot be with you yet but his love remains undying despite the pain he's endured. It's a choice to take the more willfully difficult path. It's not something that's done out of blind faith or without this record's penchant for sentiments that have flexible, occasionally contradictory meanings that still lead back to a central thesis, no matter what they are. But the sound here is decisively employed as it always is. The thing about it that gets me is it's the instrumental swell that occurs on the chorus refrain. And it very nearly makes Sufyan's delivery of the second half of this line completely inaudible. You can just barely hear it as though the pain 
of living in the wake of all this is something that he can barely even bring himself to vocalize. It, it I, I can't even talk about it anymore or else I'm going to fucking fall apart. Is that, you know, the first time it's, I'll always love you, but I cannot live with you. And the second time it's, I will always love you, but I cannot look at you. Like more and more, it's a distancing from any kind of illusion of stasis, right? Of like, of keeping things the way that they were, of some kind of false connection, of some kind of false presence, you know? And that's what it means that the song just devolves into, I don't want to fight at all. It's, I don't want to push against this. I don't want to delude myself. I don't want to, well, not even delude myself, but I just don't want to live the way that I was living you know, of creating or holding on to uh, something that just isn't there. And maybe, you know, you can read that I don't want to fight it all as, you know, I, I'm done with living. You know, you can read living as the fight and that, or you could read it the completely opposite way. You could read it as a, as a, exactly. as a moment of, of letting go of the existential trauma and just, being free to live beyond whatever that history is as opposed to living just in the wake of it or amongst that right like it's just yeah and then he covers neil young and it's fucking gorgeous it's a cover of uh, there's a world off of neil young's classic album harvest and if you haven't heard harvest or this song I mean, I imagine it would strike you this way, just knowing who Neil Young is, but not even having heard the album. But especially within the context of the album, there's a world from the get go. It's the most like, what moment in like the early part of Neil Young's discography. And, uh, you know, as someone who loves that record and really just can't quite get around the sound of that song and how ill-fitting it is on that record. It is glorious to hear someone not even, like, fix the song, but just do it in a way that, like, makes sense. I mean, I didn't know it was a cover until you pointed this out, like, yesterday. I just thought it was the logical conclusion to the album's arc. It's a perfect epilogue to just be like... I mean, what 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 is a more Sufjan way to end an album other than once he comes to his conclusion at the end of shit talk is that it's just like there is still so much here that's worth holding on to and like again knowing the things that Sufjan's gone through I, I I hate having to continually look at him through the context of tragedy but I mean for any person because everybody feels pain everybody has people die everybody has heartbreak all that stuff it's just like reminding yourself that there's still so much out there left for you to enjoy and appreciate and feel a part of is something that in the wrong hands can sound pithy or just kind of insincere but with Sufan you don't question it for a single moment because you can tell he completely and utterly believes it it's it's convincing in both musical structure and in sentiment with which it's delivered it's the the perfect way to end this record in more of a open way the the rest of the album is so you know internal and kind of myopic and then this album is a little or this song is just a little bit more forward looking it, it's less occupied with the liminal being stuck between the past and the present and is more hopeful of looking towards the future and i i just I, I appreciate it immensely. I mean, like, it would still be an amazing album if he ended it on Shit Talk, but the fact that this follows that, just it's it's the bow that the album desperately needs. I think ending on Shit Talk would just leave you in such a space of... Disrepair? <laughs> yeah, fucking... Ah, that, like, it is... No matter what came after it, so long as it was great, is like ne necessary it's not really like the same thing emotionally uh because the two records are like nothing alike really but if structurally it reminds me of um 
when the cover of My Little Corner of the World comes in at the very end of Yola Tingos, I can hear the heart beating as one. And it's just like you've gone through like the final stretch of that record, which is just like this massive swells and surges of like pure sound play, you know, within their, you know, uh, swirling indie rock vortex. And then you just gently dropped into this little modest finale that puts you back among the realm of of civilization and of of a real grounded relieving reality outside of you know everything that's consumed you um so yeah i agree it's a perfect ending um i wouldn't have it any other way it, i need it to be honest coming off of of talk and that's javelin that's that's the album I, I, I know it kind of goes yeah. without saying, really, but like I've always been a fan of Sufjan. I, like ever since I've heard Carrie and Lola, I've been a fan of Sufjan. But like Sufjan's like Radiohead in the respect that it's just like he's just so multifaceted. He's just one of those people that can spark your interest in music as a whole because he's so eclectic. He's so idiosyncratic. He has so many different sounds, so many eras, so many great pivotal works that he can just sort of spark the imagination and curiosity of anybody who manages to come across him. And he's of course garnered a really devoted fan base, which is what has led to this album being received pretty rapturously, which is awesome. But like, just as a fan of his, I just really, really, really hope that he's going to be okay. Cause like all of that, like outpouring of shit like it was nice to see like and like a lot of people be really like sympathetic obviously but like as for somebody who has had a really difficult time like reckoning with like putting himself out there with carrie and lol like i remember i don't know if it was like an interview or something but it was like he was talking about carrie and lol once and he was just like i don't want to write songs about my fucking dead mother anymore like he's he's clearly in a weird place with putting himself out there so much so for him to be so extroverted with all of this shit that's happened to him it can't necessarily be easy like getting over his illness getting over that loss and stuff it's like that's that's difficult like thorny shit and like, I hope he's better, like even like just I, I feel like he's a dude who's going to make music until like the end of time. But like if this for whatever reason, if like he was just like, I'm spent, I just want to kind of live and maybe do some frivolous stuff here. If like if this is like his crown jewel or whatever, or if it just ends up being one album in a series of many many more either way i i can't imagine a, a a better sort of way to just sort of summarize your entire career at this point by delivering something that's so immediately satisfying but rewarding to return to like the thing that i think kept me from saying that sufyan was maybe one of my favorite artists beforehand was that i never found my sufyan album like I, I like some of his records are masterpieces and I love them and I listen to them all the time. But like Riley's got Age of Odds, like lots of people have Carrie and Lowell odds at like and I, I feel like Javelin finally is the one that just sort of clicked for me in the way that none of his records had before, despite the fact that all of them are like of easily comparable quality. So in a week where I have been anxious and fraught and his music has been an absolute bomb and while the world is scary and bad this has been pivotal in like keeping myself grounded and i am immensely appreciative to just it he's the kind of artist that you are just happy to be alive at the same time as well, we don't typically do this for everything we review anymore but i think we should absolutely do our favorite tracks and ratings for sufyan stevens yeah. Three favorite tracks are So You Are Tired, Shit Talk, Will Anybody Ever Love Me? Ten, Album of the Year, baby. Yeah, my, my three favorites, So You Are Tired, uh, Will Anybody Ever Love Me? Which I finally thought of the song that like the standard that that most reminded me of. And it's, it's also a Neil Young song. It's Only Love Can Break Your Heart off of after the gold oh rush. shit so, yeah and, I'm, and i'll shout out shit talk as well that hard nine with room to grow oh yeah uh, my three favorite songs are goodbye evergreen shit talk and so you are tired 
And so I'm true. I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. Yeah, this is one of the best albums of the year, unequivocally. Bravo. Which gives us an average overall of 9.3 for Sufjan Stevens' Javelin. Let us know what you think of the new album from Sufjan Stevens and indeed any of his albums in the comments below. Let us know what you thought of our <laughs> harried, I'm going to go with, breakdown of this remarkable record. Let us know what your thoughts are in the comments below so we can continue the conversation about one of the greatest musicians of our generation. If you want to go above and beyond and support the channel directly for just $1 a month, you can hit the join button, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, get your name and the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend some music for us to talk about on the show in one of our now episodes, I'm sure one of those will happen again soon enough then you will get to do that. That will be your entitlement and you will be able to hold it high. Until next time though, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, all things go, all things go.